Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives, and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. We're live? Okay. Thank you guys for joining. This is Table Talk. It's kind of a weird intro. We got a new soundboard. We're trying to figure out how to get it all working so we can work out some of the sound issues that you guys have been talking about. Before I get going with the show, I want to thank those people over the past week that have joined the join the crew if you go to the description and you click the button join the crew you know what we're talking about that's a um <clears throat> it's to help you guys support the table talk podcast i set this up uh, about a month ago in a way to be able to give back to you guys so when you join the crew you'll get 14 of my ebooks for free you get 15 percent off all table talk items that's the coffee the limited edition apparel this shirt will drop next week by the way and <clears throat> access to any exclusive content that we get after we hit 200 members. Right now we're somewhere around 50 to 60-ish, and so the more that come on, the more content we'll be able to do. So I wanna appreciate the guys that signed up last week. Anybody that's on the fence about it, sign up and let's go from there. With that aside, we'll just get on to the show. Today my guest is Mike Touchere. There's a lot of different avenues that we can go down. You know, it's, I'm kind of a programming nerd, so I'm going to try to keep it all towards, you know, programming. <laughs> but to put some context for the people who don't know who you are, who obviously probably haven't been around. Um, I think where I'll we'll start was years ago, I put together a rank your powerlifting coach mm-hmm. list of questions. So the reason I want to start with that is because it, it was I thought it was really solid. Right. Yeah. Until you sent me a message <clears throat> saying this isn't so solid. And it was because you were trying uh Brazilian jiu-jitsu or something oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah I remember this yeah yes and it was it was very it was an eye-opening thing for me because <laughs> where it where it lacks strength is if you're a be- complete beginner well I don't know I didn't think of it as it lacking strength but just that my interpretation of it was a little bit off yeah and that there was a little clarity uh needed a little clarification so what happened was I mean, I've been competing in powerlifting since forever, and uh, I had gotten a little bit beat up and decided I was going to take a break from signing up for competitions, still training, uh, but just doing stuff that didn't hurt, mm-hmm. you know? And since I did that, I thought, man, there's all these other physical things that I've just been putting on the back burner because I'm competing in powerlifting. Now, now's the time for me to dive into some of that. Uh, and I've always been curious about... Um, MMA, let's say, just broadly. So I signed up for a boxing class. I signed up for a kickboxing class. And, you know, there's so much out there, you know, and I'm thinking, like, how do I tell who's legit here, who's going to be a good coach for me? And uh, anyway, so I'm, I called the, called this guy on the phone and, uh, you know, kind of going down the list, like, um, uh, you know, what have you done as an athlete? You know, he had... Uh, he'd fought like up to the UFC level. Like he wasn't like big time, but he had definitely, he'd definitely yeah. done some stuff in the UFC, UFC. And, um, you know, who have you learned under, man, he had traveled the world and learned under a bunch of different coaches. And I got to the question of like, well, who have you, who have you trained? Who have you coached? And he got a little offended at that question. Like, you know, <laughs> what do you need to know, dude? You know, like you, mm-hmm. you've you never done any of this before. Like, what do you want me to say? And I mean, he didn't say that, yeah. it, but you could read between the lines and tell like, mm-hmm. what he was thinking, right? And I thought about it later. I was like, yeah, it's kind of a dick thing to say. Like, I've never even stepped foot. Mm-hmm. You know, I've never done any of this. Um, like the closest I'd done is some like wrestling classes at the Air Force Academy years ago, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so surely there's plenty to learn so kind of what i took away from it was the who have you coached question specifically is 
like I would tweak it a little bit to be like, have you coached people like me? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was my main yes. takeaway. But yeah, less in my mind, at least it was less a critique of the, of the method and more mm -hmm. just like a tuning of it. No, it most definitely. <laughs> yeah. And it was because it was one of those things where I'm like, Oh, I get what he's saying here a hundred percent. Cause yeah. you can click all those other boxes and we'll go through them really quick with you. You can click all those other boxes, but if you're not, if, if you're not skilled at working with that demographic. Right. And i had a biased view that that demographic was going to be, you know, Same. competitive lifters, yeah. you know, mid level or above. Yeah. You know, which then I say 100 percent. That's still yeah, yeah. that still plays it. But that would be like you said, it's with the demographic that you are yeah. or that is looking for that. Yeah. So with the first one, we'll go with um, your formal education. Honestly, not a lot of formal education in and around coaching. Uh, I mean, I've read obsessively about training stuff since uh, God, since I was in junior high. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, my. Uh, I would kind of rate that as some early education for me. When did when did you start the Q and A? So 2000, yeah. honestly, it was probably right around the time that you started. Yeah. I was reading the Q and A and uh, reading all the articles every week. Um, started getting the books that people mm -hmm. recommend that you get, um, and really probably more than that, uh, looking at programs. You know, I got a lot out of looking at specific programs and you know especially later on once you because like you can read a bunch of these books you know you pick up block periodization by Isherin or something and it's so general it's so broad that it's difficult to know just from that alone what does this mean to me mm -hmm. in the gym today you know uh, but then you look at how it's applied and you start to see oh okay so this is the application of that principle you know, and then it's easier to see some other tangential applications of it. So, oh, okay, so you could set up, uh, you know, say you're doing some metabolic conditioning work. You could set it up like this, or you could tweak the variables a little bit and set it up in a slightly different way, and it still, you know, meets the criteria that's outlined, you know, so on. So yeah, yeah. On. But, um, so yeah, I guess I would say, I don't know, it's kind of corny to say self-taught, but I mean, it was self-education for sure. Mm -hmm. Learning from other people, um, read every Powerlifting USA that came out. Yeah, yeah. well, outside yeah. of the training sphere, you still, right. you went to the Naval Academy, I believe, right? Air Force Academy. Air Force yeah. Academy. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Yes. Yeah, so. I studied there and uh, I was in the Air Force for five years on active duty. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's you, you learned how to learn? Sure. You know, yeah. through through that. Fair so enough. that's kind of where that formal education yeah. comes in is, you know, has the person acquired the ability to be able to look <laughs> deeper than surface level? Yeah. You know, like not just the I'm going to date myself, not just the old Flex magazine. Right. You know, but actually like where did this come from? Yeah. yeah. And then be able to go and find that um, with who have, the. I want to say who have you trained with, right? Mm -hmm. But you spent the majority of your time training alone, right? So it yeah. really comes more around um, the network of people that you were around, right. you know, during that time, because that's right. that brainstorming of ideas and stuff yeah. like that. Well, in that, that time too, so uh, I would say around 2007, 2008 is really when I was competing most in the open, uh, was started around that time frame, you know, and that's also when like powerlifting was very distinctly online still, you know, um, some places had crews and groups of people that would train, but you know, Hey, uh, when I was stationed at Vandenberg, uh, in California, there was, there was one guy who lived the next city over that had a power rack. So we would train together, you know, but other than that, it's like the base gym. And if I could get somebody to hold the camera, yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that kind of thing. Um, so a lot of like, who have you trained with? Like, who are your like peer influences? You know, that came in an online setting. Um, but my background was competing in, in USA powerlifting and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was fortunate to be able to travel around to, uh, lift with people like Matt and Susie Gary were huge influences on me, uh, especially, uh, a little bit later on, like from 2009 onward, I would say those like early years, especially 
uh, in my junior uh, lifting career, I was a very inconsistent lifter, missed a lot of attempts on the platform and like, getting to know Matt and Susie specifically and like learning a bit more about their philosophy specifically on around competition and attempt selection and stuff like that was uh, really critical to my development. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that was a big one. So, um, just kind of learning from other people, like, like you said, programming nerd, mm -hmm. right? So it's become a lot harder, I think, to know what top lifters are doing. Mm -hmm. I think it's easy to know like what the highlights of their training are, but it's hard to know like what the nuts and bolts are. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't, it's just not postable, you know? Yes. And so we used to keep training logs and it, on forums and stuff like that, but that's kind of gone away too. And you, mm. even with that, I mean, we'll get into the nuances with that later, sure. but even that's extremely limited. Yeah. You know, like what's three times eight really mean? Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I've got a buddy who says that, uh, you know, there's a, he talks about there being a skill to training, you know, and this is definitely a feather in the cap of like actually training with, in person with uh, experienced folks. Because there's so much that goes on that, just can't be written on the paper mm -hmm. you know like even if you're gonna you, you want to prescribe everything down to the rest interval fine you know it gets to be tedious to execute a, a workout like that but you know you can't prescribe like how much how much focus and energy do you do you need to bring to this set mm -hmm. and it might be easy to say well all of it all the time well that's not realistic you know but if you train with people you'll see that for some sets, they bring a lot of energy and then other sets they're, you know, still focused, but maybe dialing it back a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, and there's an art to that, you know, and I think that it's much easier to learn that in person. If you're not in person, it's one of those, you just got to figure it out. Yes. Mm -hmm. Figure it out by doing, you yeah. know, which goes to the next question of, you know, what have you done in the sport, which, you know, there's, there's a lot, you know, that, <laughs> that's in there. So you started competing, I believe in what, 2000 three yeah those are yeah. the first like actual sanctioned official competitions yes yeah. so it's what got you into the sport first before we go down that whole of what you've done how did it happen yeah. uh football you know i played football and of course de facto you're gonna lift weights if yeah. you're playing football in, in the u.s so um i very quickly went from football player who lifts weights to power lifter who plays football you know <laughs> yeah. um yeah, that progression was quick, you know. But, I mean, this was like like late 90s, you know. Like we didn't even have internet at the house, mm -hmm. you know. So it was Powerlifting USA and my dad would print off articles from he'd print off articles from Elite, he'd print off articles from like Dave Draper, mm -hmm. uh, Dave Draper's website and stuff like that. There weren't weren't a whole ton of them no. back yeah. then, you know. And man, I would read all that stuff and um, I'm thankful that like I was a freshman in high school and, uh, you know, I show up to my first football team weightlifting session and I'm like, Hey coach, I, I wrote my own program mm -hmm, <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. and I'm a hundred percent certain it was trash. You know, mm -hmm. how could it not be, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, but I'm thankful that he looked at it and I don't know what he thought, but I imagine that he thought something like, well, at least the kid's enthusiastic mm -hmm. and he let me do it, you know? Yeah. And I, I was enthusiastic about it and, uh, you know, it really turned into a passion. So that was a power lifter that played football in the off season. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So from yeah. there, how long did it take you to get to your first nationals? And it was IPF, correct? correct. Or not IPF, yeah. but USAPL. Yeah. The hell back then was it ADF? No, you weren't no, like that no. far. <laughs> not quite. I mean, that was it's pretty close. 97 was when that switch happened, but no, my first, my first sanctioned competition was in 2003, but you know, we did the football team mm -hmm. stuff in, in high school, but, uh, uh, the, the first real one was, uh, in 2003 and probably 2004 was my first collegiate nationals. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how'd that go? Not, not great. <laughs> <laughs> how so? Uh, I bombed out of that meet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mentioned in my early, those early stages were, uh, kind of marked by inconsistent lifting and mm -hmm. see this is the problem when you're coming up and you know essentially self-taught on all this stuff from stuff you read in magazines 
you know, I knew in theory what attempt selection was supposed to be like, you know, but this is equipped lifting too. So there's always this fine line of, you know, is it heavy enough for me to hit depth? Is it heavy enough mm -hmm. for me to touch? Uh, but also light enough that I can actually do it, mm -hmm. you know, and you're trying to walk that line, but also inexperienced. And also like as a college kid, you're not going to have like gear and backup gear and loose shirts and stuff like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you wouldn't know how to manage all that even if you had it. Um, there was a guy who uh, lived up in Denver. So this was all while I was a cadet at, in Colorado Springs. There was a guy who lived up in Denver, Dan Goudreau, who's like a multi-time IPF world champion. And I could make it up to visit him like now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was incredibly helpful when I did. And that's what saved my bacon a couple times uh, in several different ways. But uh, uh, yeah, Dan really helped me out, but you, there's only so much he could do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I learned the hard way on, in like three out of four collegiate competitions. You know, so I would compete in collegiate nationals and junior nationals a couple times. Uh, but collegiates, for some reason, were always always a rough go. Yeah. Yeah. Now, over the preceding six to eight years, I believe, mm -hmm. were reoccurring trips to nationals in the worlds correct yeah so i started going to junior worlds my first junior worlds was 2005 so 2005 i went and i can't remember how i placed maybe third or something um 2006 uh, we went to bulgaria and i won the junior worlds that year um 2007 is when i graduated so i didn't didn't compete uh, internationally that year but then 2008 I was at the open level uh, and starting to compete in the open yeah and that what were the placings there from 2008 because you were on a run until yeah. there was a six-year break which we'll talk about that but yeah. you were on a run up until that point right yeah and so it, 2008 it was the world championship uh, 2009 was the world games in Taiwan uh, then 2010 and 11 uh, I started dabbling in some raw lifting. It hadn't quite made it to the IPF level yet. Mm -hmm. So there was uh, uh, some raw federations in Florida. Yeah. Uh, raw unity meet was uh, pretty big at that time. Uh, so I dabbled in some of that. Uh, raw lifting was always kind of, it was kind of the thing that was most interesting to me. It's mm -hmm. like, how strong am I? Um, but then competing in equipment was just how you would do it internationally. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then in 2012, when the IPF added in uh, the Classic World Cup, the, uh, the Raw Division, uh, came back to that. And so from like 2012 to 2015, I was kind of focused on the, the Raw Worlds at the IPF. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> was it the World Games you won? Yeah, in 2009. Yeah. Okay, and the other ones were seconds, I believe. Yeah, uh, second. Yeah, mostly seconds, I think. Uh, there was a third place in... 13 and dropped a couple deadlifts like yeah heartbreaker third place so yeah i know that sucks it no, <laughs> sucks <laughs> so the 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 credibility as far as the experience is sure. it's definitely it's 100 percent there for those yeah. that are listening but i'm intrigued now because i want to go yeah. back to the the raw unity because yeah. i remember that time very very well yeah um it was my, I'm trying to figure out how to how to word this question is I want to say why did you decide to do that but there's more context that I think needs to be put out there um, it was getting a lot of criticism from from everybody not just like the multiply like oh it's raw it was even the single plot you know even yeah. the, the camp that you were competing from you yeah. know that whole side because the IPF wasn't recognizing it nobody else was recognizing it but there was a small group of you guys you know probably less than 50 you know, if I'm going to think of the broad scope yeah. overall yeah. that just said, you know what, screw all you guys, we're going to do this, <laughs> you know? So why, like what was so intriguing to you to be that super minority, right? Yeah, Cause yeah. it's what it was yeah. to be able to say, you know, forget all the noise mm -hmm. and the noise wasn't like it was today, but it was still there. Yeah. You know, forget all the noise. And what was it about it? Well, I think it just, kind of competing raw squat bench deadlift unequipped uh was something that was always interesting to me like even as i was training for like single ply competitions 
I always cared about like what what can I bench without the shirt, mm-hmm. you know, and just like personally, it was important to me. Yeah. So having a chance to compete that way uh, was automatically interesting. Um, and I mean, like the bigger picture of like why do it, I'm still not quite sure. Like. I didn't expect like fame. <laughs> yeah, no, no, anything. no. I don't think anybody you know? did. Well, like you know? any of the like external rewards, yeah. you know. So, I don't know. I mean, even now, like it ties into to now. Like as I start to dabble with competing again, and I know we're jumping mm-hmm. around a bit, but I start to dabble with competing again. I do think to myself, like, why, why do this? Like, there's obvious downsides. What are the upsides? I don't know. It's interesting. It's mm-hmm. fun, you know, and. I don't know. Sometimes just being fun might be enough. Yeah, yeah I, I may be overplaying the criticism back then as well because that's probably a, the bad way to explain it. Most people just indifference. Like yeah. Most lifters were just indifferent. Like, well, whatever, you're going to go do this in the off season. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. and, <laughs> most of the, well, a lot of the people that were around me were kind of, I think what you're talking about just kind of shook their heads and like, well, okay, all right, I guess you'll do that for. A little while when you get bored of it you can come back you know? yeah that's kind of the hell how it was it, nobody yeah. really expected the whole raw yeah <clears throat> side to blow up yeah. as it did and actually form divisions <laughs> right. which was weird back then though because i do kind of remember with the whole raw unity thing over the three or four years it, it got weird too because like a raps yeah. loud or not allowed or what sleeves and yeah. like you know it, that <laughs> well, i mean it's the I don't know. It's the, seems to be the curse of powerlifting, right? Yes. Is like this uh, equipped arms race. I mean, you see it a little bit now. You know, mm-hmm. like for a while we decided that for most feds anyway, uh, raw was sleeves and a belt and wrist wraps. You know, but now it's like, well, can we push the boundaries on sleeves? What about this sleeve? What about that sleeve? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's getting closer and closer to. It's like, guys, this is we're going the same direction. You know. Mm-hmm. So, That's how multiply ended yeah. up being multiply is yeah. because well, people kept. I mean, it's funny because, like, <laughs> the equipped lifters know this, right? Mm-hmm. And so they're looking at this going, like, you know what you're doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> We've seen this before. Right, yeah. Actually, twice, right? Because it's yeah. it, it, <laughs> the multiply, then the single ply, and yeah. now actually three times because now we're seeing it slowly start but, to emerge. Like, bench shirts are a good example of that. Mm-hmm. You know, like, the single ply bench shirts were still pretty garbage until well until enzer's patent ran out on it and titan came out with the the fury i believe Mm -hmm. and uh you know that kind of opened up single ply bench shirts uh single ply started to look a lot more single ply shirts started to look a lot more like multi-ply shirts Mm -hmm. and perform similarly too Mm -hmm. and then the ipf goes uh, at least in the little world that i'm occupying right the Mm -hmm. ipf says hey wait a second we don't really like how this is going how do we limit this uh, and you know they're they make some attempts to to limit bench shirt technology and it's a similar conversation to what you see happening right now with bench rules like mm-hmm. should we allow the extreme arches or not you know mm-hmm. so, i don't know how things repeat themselves in in some ways you know it, well, it, it does and it is it's if you've been around long <laughs> enough like you said it is a it's a it's the curse of powerlifting that goes all the way back to day one and the the longer you're around it decades around it you see it it's like so actually i think i'll ask you because you're still you're still competing you know once you stop competing and you're away from it it doesn't bother you as much because you can see it more clearly for what it really is when you're still competing i think it pisses you off (laughs) because you're still in it you know and it actually impacts you um you had a break you know for that so as you're seeing these debates discussions now you Mm -hmm. know after I mean, you're still involved, so it yeah. wasn't really a break. Um, are you less? Are you more indifferent to all those conversations at this point than you were? Yeah, I mean, my reasons for competing are just different than they used to be, and this is something I still don't fully understand about what I'm doing. I've got to figure this out at some point. But like, if you'd asked me in 2014, let's say, like, Mike, what? Do, why? why pursue this you know my reason for competing was to win Mm -hmm. you know and that's that's the objective is to win the competition win the world championship something like that but like now as i look around i mean look there's some strong strong dudes out there and 
if the right person shows up, you know, or even if they don't, even if it, Mm -hmm. who knows how far I can get with this. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that much in this kind of phase two thing just yet. I've done one competition. I've signed up for a second. So we'll see where it goes. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what's the purpose? It doesn't feel like win. That's, that's not it. So what is it? I don't know. Like I, I kind of reflect back on a lot of those second place world championship finishes. Mm -hmm. And I talk to guys who are competing at that level. Like you can see this a lot guys standing on the second place podium looking pissed off. And I've been that guy and I've got pictures of me looking all grumpy Mm -hmm. on the second place podium. Then a year or two goes by and you're not there at all. And you start going, man, the only person that that, seems like a a loss to is the guy standing there on the second place podium no one else in the world thinks that's a bad thing Mm -hmm. right and then you fast forward a little bit and you're not there at all you start going well maybe i didn't appreciate that for what it was you know and so like that's operating in the background and again i'm still trying to piece this together into like a coherent worldview it's a it's a weird there's a weird question that i used to ask the guys when I was still training at Westside and we go to a meet is just hypothetically, you know, would, would you be happier or more satisfied if you won, but total 50 kilos under your best total? Right. Or have you take second, but you actually totaled 50 kilos over your best total? Right. You know, right. which is it? And there were some people that were definitively 100%. I'm just here to win. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference. That That's not me. Yeah. You know, that confused me to all hell. Yeah. Because I'm like, no, wait a minute. You yeah. I, I mean, Cause I, you I guess I can see where you would, where some people could come from in a mentality like that. But, you know, one it, kind of a, an example of that for me was, was the 2014 Worlds. Uh, I trained my ass off going into that competition and I knew it was going to, I knew it was going to be close and take just everything. You know, if I put up my best total and the other guy is off by a little bit, then maybe I can win. You know, I knew it was Mm going to be one Mm -hmm. of those types of competitions and I lifted really well um, and still ended up taking second. And I remember feeling kind of weird after that you know Mm -hmm. it's like i'm kind of disappointed that i didn't win because that like i said at that time that's what i thought mattered to me um but also i lifted really well and i feel like that should be something to be happy about Mm -hmm. um and i was talking to i mentioned uh susie gary i mentioned talk well i talked to her about it afterwards and you know she's like well you can't control what the other guy does Mm -hmm. you know you can control what you do and if you lift well and you represent yourself well, then that's all you can do. Then that's worth being satisfied with. Mm-hmm. Well, you so, can't control who shows up either. Right. I mean, some freak out of nowhere yeah. could just show up. And <laughs> we've seen it, right? Definitely. <laughs> and just like coming like, what the hell just happened? You can't control that. Right. With, so that's your your own history. Mm-hmm. Then it would be, You when did you found reactive training systems? That started in 2008. Okay, so that was just at that time, it was just yourself. Now you got a yeah, team of coaches underneath definitely. you. So the reason I'm asking that is because it changes the way that this question is going to be answered because sure. I can say how many people have you had better than you, yeah. right? Where at a core level, if it's just you and yeah. there's not a team of people, right. then that's it's different. When there's a team of people, that um, that's – in a way, it's an extension of you, but it also it's it's people that you're bringing on as coaches to work with you that fill gaps that you may have, which makes yeah. the overall program Definitely. way better Definitely, because of yeah. all that. Yeah. So as a as a whole, you know, as reactive training systems, mm-hmm. not Mike, yeah. you know, just how how many lifters have you guys taken to a point higher than you went? Um, don't think I've coached any World Games lifters, but kind of the number that I like to to look at you know just me being a meathead I I, it's over 15 IPF world record holders no that's that's what I'm getting at is how many at the level you know what I'm saying because you can I mean what if you're the you know what if you're the freak that what if you're Ed Cohn 
Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. How, how are you gonna How are you gonna do that? Right. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, um, we regularly take a bunch of people to the world championship. You know, I'm really proud of that work. No, I, and that's the reason I've always, the reason I planted that question in there, mm-hmm. is people for a couple reasons. You have to set your ego aside to make somebody better than what you were. We yeah. know a lot of coaches that will never, will never allow that to happen. Right. It's it's it's, it's a point sure. of all that. The other thing is, at that level, when you get up to that level, the nuance becomes more important than yeah. everything else. Yeah. And that's the stuff that, I, that's the stuff I'm going to talk about later is that little nuancey yeah, type yeah. things because that's huge. For those guys at that level, it's everything. Yeah. It really is because all the low hanging stuff is. Well, it makes an outsized difference too. I might be getting ahead of us. But yeah. Uh, I mean, that's been something that I've been thinking about more lately. You know, you take somebody who doesn't know how to show up consistently to the gym and you really dial in their nutrition. I mean, that does almost nothing, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> but you take somebody who's already got the boxes checked and you really dial in their nutrition, it makes like an outsized impact. It makes a bigger impact than you would otherwise expect, you know, based on like, well, this isn't supposed to be one of the big rocks. But if everything else is dialed in, you know, it's like, oh, well, it, it's going to give you a... a one or two percent advantage well it seems like if everything else is dialed in we're talking more on the two percent maybe even more than that side of things you know Mm -hmm. so it it, there's no point in the the other questions are you know how many years of what's the training age how Mm -hmm. many years you've been coaching Mm -hmm. that's just rehashing what we just said because when you founded the companies when you started the coaching you've been competing so all those you know everything gets checked at the highest level when you go through my rank the powerlifting coach type (laughs) thing to where that's i I don't i don't like to work gold standard but the people that are out there that are aspiring to be better coaches not just in the powerlifting but really in any sport just trade out i don't want to say periodization um Programming is programming is yeah. programming is programming. You just got to sure. take whatever the overall objective is and swap it to be able to meet the yeah. demands of whatever thing else is. <laughs> they should be following your content, you know, looking at what you're doing because of all those reasons there. All those boxes are filled, right? So when you're speaking and when we talk about training here, it's <clears throat> we'll agree that all training is kind of the same, you know, if it's locks, <laughs> linear, kind sure. of whatever it is, yeah. there's the same parts everywhere. It gets very nuanced where you're a little different is a lot of people will go from that macro approach and say, okay, here's this three year plan or here's mm-hmm. this one year plan and then spool it down. Let me, let me back that up. They'll start with that one year approach detailed, mm-hmm. right? And then spool it down mm-hmm. into whatever that micro cycle or day will be and where i say detailed because i'm not saying you don't do that it could be templated in like here's what the future kind of looks like but you're so it's top down right where you're more bottom up let's let's look at what works here you know Mm -hmm. for this week micro cycle you know however the micro cycle is going to be defined for those people listening a week typically means a micro cycle but it doesn't typically always mean that right it doesn't have to you're not locked in it's this it's next to the training day it's the smallest unit of measure you know in the training program and um where you want to dial in that first and then expand out from there is that kind of a broad overview yeah i think so you know but i mean A lot of my formative thoughts on this actually comes from reading the early Q&A and like I'm listening to guys like you and Jim and and the rest of the guys talk about like uh, you've got to you've got to find what works for you. Everybody's a little bit different. You know, here's general principles, but you've got to figure out the details, you Mm -hmm. know, and 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 also that the details matter Uh, and you can do this through this process of kind of listening to your body, figuring out how to push it and when not to. And people would say like, well, okay, how do you do that? And you'd say something like, well, it's going to take you about 10 years to figure it Mm -hmm. out. And I'm coaching these cadets at the Air Force Academy. I'm thinking, well, we don't have that time, Mm -hmm. right? So how do I distill this stuff that I'm learning, that I'm figuring out and teach it to other people, try to shorten that time frame? down a little bit so that was kind of what's operating in the background of my mind through some of the the earlier stuff 
Um, and some of this is, is an extension of that, you know, like a microcycle, this small unit, this small grouping of uh, training sessions, you know, how long should the microcycle be? How many microcycles should make up your training block? Uh, well, that varies. And there's a process that we can go through to figure out, you know, well, for you, it's going to be three weeks. For you, it's going to be six weeks or eight weeks or whatever. And it's dialed into that individual rather than being an arbitrary, you know, you set it at an arbitrary five weeks, let's mm -hmm. say, you know, well, for some people that's too long. And then other people that's not long enough, you know, and we'd be better off if we could dial it in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What variables are you looking at? I and mean, there's a ton, right? Yeah. I mean, what are the main key variables that you're looking to determine that? The main thing, I think it's really important to keep the goal the goal. And it's really useful for something like powerlifting because we can say, you know, where is your estimated 1RM? Where is it, where's your capacity to express 1RM strength? You know, and it doesn't have to be displayed right now, but we just need to know how strong are you basically. Mm -hmm. And we're going to optimize everything to that. You know, if this makes your squat stronger, then that's the thing that we care about. Uh, if it makes your bench better, that's the thing that we care about. Uh, so starting there, uh, I think is important. And then from there, everything else can follow, you know, well, how much volume do I do? Well, you do the amount of volume that makes your 1RM go up the most. Uh, how much, what exercises do I pick? The exercises that make your 1RM go mm -hmm. up the most. And you at least start there, you know, and I think there's some, there's plenty of direction that you can go into. And like one thing that you might think of is uh, what about this concept from, uh, from periodization more broadly, but that, you know, one block should lead to the adaptations that will enhance the next block and so on. I mean, that's fine, we can do that, but it should be built on a foundation of what produces the biggest change in our 1RM strength. Mm -hmm. You know, so if, uh, we've seen people who have these really unusual responses, right? Um, people who, when you start to add in high intensity work singles, let's mm -hmm. say, or, or anything that's particularly heavy in their training, they get beat up. They don't get stronger and eventually they'll they'll get dinged up injured or you know at least they're not getting stronger right so we've sent people to competition having done nothing heavier than like six reps at an eight or nine rpe so that put them around like just over 80 percent you know uh, and they'll go into a competition that way and just obliterate some prs because that's the thing that makes them stronger mm -hmm. now there's some other ways that you can tweak that because that's got some obvious weaknesses right like yeah you've not touched anything that heavy. So how do we know where to gauge your opener? Let's say, mm -hmm. well, we can, we can get around that tactically, but we start from this idea that this is the thing that moves your one RM the most. So let's start there. And then you can build on that, you know, okay, if this is the thing that moves it the most, what's the thing that moves it second most, you know, well, that can be the block prior. Or if you start to notice a relationship, like, yeah, this block is my best, block my greatest hits let's say mm -hmm. uh, this other block seems to help you know when i do um when i do some conditioning work prior uh to my greatest hits block my greatest hits block is even better mm -hmm. you know or one problem that i see a lot is people will kind of find this greatest hits block and they'll just hammer it over and over and over and over yeah, yeah. You know, i mean that works for about two blocks you know? oh, yeah no, they'll get yeah. accumulated to it yeah well <laughs> yeah they've just beat it to death yeah. you know you got to do something different so kind of look at starting to look at that sequence of of saying like okay what's the sequence of things that's leading to better results and look for most people it ends up looking kind of like your traditional powerlifting program. Mm -hmm. You would expect that because if that was like bad news for most people, then we would have figured that out a long yeah. time ago. Yeah. Right. But it's the, it, first of all, it's the details of figuring out like the details of what is best for you. Mm -hmm. But then there are these outliers that are not all that rare, you know? And if you're one of those outliers, that gets to be really important to you. <laughs> you know? Well, a hundred percent. It's, some of the small things that, that tie into that is 
you know, my my time at Westside is to, to illustrate kind of what you're talking about in a in a smaller scale. Is you know we would find, I would find, you know, certain exercise like a close grip incline bench, you know, done in a two or three week variation, yeah. made my dynamic benches move way faster, yeah. way more forceful. I pull that out. Like, okay, we're gonna, this goes before the meet. This yeah, doesn't yeah. happen any other time. Yeah. Maybe here and there, spare you out, you know, just to make yeah. sure I can still do it, you know, and right. Do it right. Or, you know, so a lot of those, or different tricep extensions, you, you play around with them in the off season and run them for, can I run it for three times in a row? Which could be, you know, each week for three weeks, or it could be three concurrent sessions. You know, what works best? Yeah. And that would all play off in the quote unquote non meat training time. Sure. To figure out, you know, what has the greatest impact, what doesn't, you know, and then when meat came, whatever that peaking block, for lack of a better term, because yeah. Louis would never say that, but it, it, <laughs> it was, right? So that five weeks or whatever it was, what goes in there? Well, the gold shit, yeah, you know, yeah. that goes in there, yeah. you know, and it was stumbling across, you know, a lot of what you're taking to a higher level at this point because us as just exercises or with the max effort work is it threes is it singles yeah. you know where's the greatest um correspondence yeah. to the movements this is the difference to the movements that we saw carried over to the competition movements not right. necessarily directly the competition movements yeah you know so you're looking for those correlations to those competition movements yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities there. Yes. You know? yeah. And um, outside of just the movements, though, yeah. you're looking at um, speed, yeah. well, tension. Yeah, intensity, like how, what weight on the bar is, is you know, giving us the best return. Um, you know, we are kind of assuming, at least the programs I write, I mm -hmm. tend to assume that we're pushing as hard as we can, you know, pretty much every rep. You know the compensatory acceleration mm -hmm. idea, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know. You could argue that that's maybe not exactly true. You know, maybe, I think maybe not. But you can't argue. I don't think with the intent. Yeah. You know, if somebody, what's the negative of somebody's intent coming out of the bottom of a lift to try to move yeah. the lift as forcefully as they can? Sh yeah. <laughs> try, try hard, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean that that's a interesting thing in itself like the the whole idea of rpe um as it applies to powerlifting uh some of the origins of that were from reading the the q a you know i'm reading the q a and and again you and jim and mm -hmm. some of these guys are talking about hey you guys you could leave a rep in the tank on your tricep extensions and it'll help you recover a little bit better and that just blow in people's minds mm -hmm. you know like wait a minute i don't have to take all of my tricep push downs to utter failure mm -hmm. right you know so it's like well yeah you could leave a rep in the tank you could also leave two reps in the tank or three and you could kind of choose this proximity to failure and at the same time i was uh like a like a good powerlifting student i was trying to read super training <laughs> yeah 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 that's what you were supposed to do at the time <laughs> and um there's a, a section in there about rpe and that mm -hmm. was kind of my introduction to the idea you know as it originated with endurance sports and i thought well man if you put these two things together you know like a, a one to ten rating of difficulty scale uh and then you kind of use this how many reps could you have done uh sort of framework well those things fit together and that kind of became the rpe chart that we see in in powerlifting today yeah i was going to get to that origins of that and how how many iterations did you have to make to adjust that or was it pretty kind of got lucky <laughs> kind of yeah. got lucky uh hit it from the start i mean in the way that it is and to be fair like it's kind of well it took on a life of its own in a lot of ways you know like if i nowadays people will talk about like reps in reserve as being a, a mm -hmm. thing distinct from it and I mean, for most things that we're doing with a barbell, they're fairly interchangeable and probably reps in reserve is a little bit more of an intuitive mm -hmm. measure. But one thing that RPE, I think, does have over reps in reserve is that 
RPE can be applied to other things as well. Things that, you know, don't lend themselves as well to like this concept of reps and reserve. Like if you're going to do something that's really high rep, like you're going to do 20 rep leg presses or something like that. Like, well, is it one rep in reserve or two? Like, well, fuck, I don't know. It's, Mm -hmm. it's really hard, you know? Yeah. And it's got this feeling of difficulty. Uh, another thing is like weightlifting movements. Like I've got a friend who, uh, has applied RPE style training to weightlifting, but the way that he's done it is they'll do it with barbells first. You know, you do a whole bunch of squats and presses and whatever else, uh, using this concept of RPE reps and reserve, you get a feeling like that's what an eight RPE feels like. And then you can apply it to things that don't lend themselves as well to reps, like a clean jerk, right? Mm -hmm. Like, one rep in the tank doesn't mean the same thing there, but you can kind of feel a level of difficulty. Yeah. That feels like about how an eight should feel, you know, it takes on more of a a linguistic quality, you know, it's definitely more subjective, but Hey, if you, if you're experienced with it and it works, then great. How do you communicate that with the clients that you guys are working with? So to make sure you're on the same page. Yeah. Fortunately, I don't have that problem too much. Like working mostly with power lifters, I'm able to, you know, stick to, you know, the chart as written, but you wouldn't want to do it with anybody who wasn't, you know, fairly experienced, I think, you know, and even then you're going to need to calibrate it in certain ways. So it's definitely like, it it doesn't stand up as well, you know, to like people that want to poke at it and say, Hey, wait, that wasn't really an eight RP. I mean, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Yeah. Um, you know, at least with, you know, you're talking about squats, I could say I had two reps in the tank and I'll prove it, you know? Yeah. Um, but you could do something similar with farmer's walks. Like there's no such thing as a rep in farmer's walks, but you do a set of farmer's walks and go, yeah, it feels like about an eight RPE, Mm -hmm. you know, but reps and reserve isn't really a thing there. I've always said that it, it, it really doesn't matter as long as it's understood between the coach and the person working with the coach, Yeah. what the eight is what the nine is, what yeah. the six is, because anything outside of that isn't really relevant, you know, because there's other things that are going to go into the context of yeah. why you would tell or your exactly. team would tell somebody a seven. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Where somebody will just see the seven and not understand maybe you, it was supposed to be an eight, but you took it to a seven because of all these other circumstances that are, sure. that are going on. So it's, well, we see, we see stuff like that with bar speed too. You know, like if you're talking about like this, uh, like the normal environment of training where, you know, you're doing a set and you're rested uh, and it's a fairly typical exercise that you're used to uh, that you'll see this relationship between bar speed and RPE. The closer you get to failure, the slower the bar moves. Yeah. 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 But there's other, there's certain movements that are weird. Like I was doing some front squats earlier today. Mm -hmm. Front squats weird because it kind of moves at the same speed until you get like maybe you might have one grindy rep and then that's it, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, so it drops off really rapidly. And then if you're doing something like uh, multiple sets with short rest intervals and you're accumulating that fatigue, you know, it'll move fast. It'll move like a six or seven RPE set, but Mm -hmm. you didn't really have that many reps because again, you're going to tank quick as you accumulate that fatigue from short rest intervals. So like, it's it's back to what you're saying like this is communication between Mm -hmm. athlete and coach as long as we understand the context and we know what we mean then that's the important thing yeah you know and like lots of people you know don't rate rpe at all and you know people have gotten stronger since time immemorial Mm -hmm. without attaching a number to it it doesn't mean that there's not an rpe like the difficulty of a set is a thing whether you acknowledge it or not, mm-hmm. you know, now it exists. And it, if writing that number down and m- changing your decision-making makes the training better then great. If it doesn't, then we need to pick a different tool. Yes. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's peel this back a little bit where, cause early on, I assume with your powerlifting, you're just doing, here's the linear, just do that. Or you're just doing shit, right? Because you don't know, any better. I read it in the magazine. You read it in the magazine. It just is what, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And at some point in time in your career, you're like, no, wait a minute. There has to be something better. You know, yeah. at, at what point 
or did you start with that? Right? I'm because always trying to build the better mousetrap. I know. That's what I'm saying. You got this curiosity mindset. Yeah. Like, yeah. how can we do this better? Did you go in with <laughs> that or did it develop over a period of time? Man, I remember being in high school and <laughs> I grew up in the, grew up in Southern Indiana and we'd go, we'd go deer hunting, right? Mm -hmm. And being out in the woods with a little notepad writing down, what if I did 12 sets of two instead of 10 sets of three? You know? mm -hmm. And I probably missed out on a bunch of hunting mm -hmm. <laughs> because I'm off in the clouds thinking about lifting weights. You mm -hmm. know? So, I mean, I was thinking about it even then, you know, how do I, how do I improve on this? You know, so that, that part didn't really change. I think. You know? At what point did that, I, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to guess, right? Sure. I, you hit a certain point, mm -hmm. you know, where it just gets out of hand. Right. <laughs> and then when it gets out of hand, you start thinking, this is too much. Oh, yeah. Right. Because there are so many freaking variables mm -hmm. that you can't begin to even. That's where the whole, I mean, it's, we, yeah. I don't want to bash periodization, but that's where the whole periodization thing gets a little whack for me. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're making a lot of assumptions mm -hmm. about things that happen outside of sets times reps times, you know, the percentage, mm -hmm. you know, which is basically the old Western method of powerlifting sure. is just, here's only one lift, right? It's yeah, only yeah. the squat that's programmed, forget the other ones. And you're going to base that whole program just yeah. on that, but yet not take into accountability a yeah. zillion other things. Yeah. So for me, that time period was probably around 2015 or so, maybe somewhere in there. I remember it very clearly because I'd like come in contact with some of these ideas, right? Like, hey, everybody responds to training a little bit differently. Hey, there's these problems like, yeah, you're implementing this top-down block structure, but that may not be ideal, you know? Like, how do you know how long the block should be? And you get, from a coaching standpoint, a practical standpoint, you get these weird results too. I would train somebody, and it didn't happen all the time, but often enough that it's a problem. Uh, and we're getting closer to the competition, and we're like two weeks out, and all of a sudden their strength just tanks hard, you know? And you go, well, shit, we're two weeks out. Like, there's not enough time to do anything, mm -hmm. you know? Like, deload, hope for the best. Like, that mm -hmm. sucks. You mm -hmm. know, nobody, no, there's no confidence in no, that No, that's terrible. Right? So, <laughs> um, you know, so you'd run into some of these problems. And uh, I was driving to the airport one day and I'm listening to this podcast and uh, they're talking to uh, Derek Evely. Now, Derek is a throws coach, a track and field coach, and he coached in Kamloops in Canada uh, and worked under Dr. Anatoly Bondarchuk, mm -hmm. uh, the famous Soviet throws coach. He, after, I forget what year it was, but he came to Canada. He was coaching there for a while. Um, Derek worked under him, you know, and I'm listening to him talk in this podcast, and he's like, yeah, you know, you could read the Bonnerchuk books, uh, which I had, mm -hmm. and but you still wouldn't come away from that and like just spit out the system that he used. Like there's key components mm -hmm. here that are missing. And what he went on to lay out was this bottom up approach to training. Uh, and I'm listening to it thinking like that answers all these problems. You know, like all these problems that I'm seeing with the training that I'm writing, these conceptual problems with the way that we program training, this answers that, you know, and I got so excited. I pulled over on the side of the highway and I'm like scribbling down a bunch of notes and stuff. I couldn't sleep for like two days after that, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of became the basis of we have taken a call on it emerging strategies because your long term plan emerges from these short term observations yeah. that you're making. Right. So we're going to figure out. Hey, these exercises, these sets, these reps, uh, correlate to your biggest improvements in strength, you know, and then, okay. So if that's your greatest hits for peaking, let's say, you know, what comes before that what comes before that, how do we best prepare you for, you know, for that training yeah. process, you know? Uh, so it all kind of was this outgrowth from, from that approach. And I think that like the top down stuff, still serves a really important purpose you know it provides you this framework of what do you do when you don't have anything else to go on because a client just knocks on your door you don't have any training data usually nothing mm -hmm. usable in most cases and you've got to come up with something well what's most likely to work well the stuff that you were taught in the books like that stuff yeah. is most likely to get you close 
and then from there it's this process of optimizing the the way that i've always seen the top-down approach would be younger people me and i know this like the old maps that we mm -hmm. used to have you need to have to open yeah. them up right right and there's just roads and shit all over the place but you highlight where you want to go mm -hmm. and you kind of see what the main road is yeah and then you just get on the road and you go and then you watch the signs to be able to get there right that is kind of how i see that top down should be yeah like here's where you want to go here's kind of how you get there mm -hmm. but you still got to figure it out as you go by right. watching the signs and you follow the signs yeah the where today and stuff. Yeah. right it's like putting it into your phone right you put in where you want to go and it's telling you everything exactly how to be able to get there which is convenient as hell yeah but from training that doesn't work you you, you see the yeah. difference where you you do need to have an understanding of I, I think that was a mistake that i made early on as i started teaching this was that i kind of overestimated how much you could infer from watching this training response and that you could almost discard uh, the knowledge of top-down, like the top-down structure, mm -hmm. that that should emerge on its own. And it should, I guess, in theory, but it helps a lot if you've got a framework to draw from at the outset, you know, that you know, well, for most people, this gets us close and we can optimize. So I guess thinking of it more as course correction rather than just yes. it's going to grow out of nothing. You yes. Know? When you have the metrics you, mm -hmm. you're tracking more metrics on the clients mm -hmm. athletes that you have yeah. right where while different there's a lot of similarities between yeah. you know what i was trying to put out there with louis on what we were doing in the gym back then right mm -hmm. it's like okay here's what we're doing which in a way is kind of bottom up right yeah, but definitely. it gets really and i'm sure you can relate to this it gets really freaking frustrating trying to explain this yeah. right when everybody's paradigm is this other this other way well they're looking for an answer and bottom up isn't an answer it's a process for you to figure it out you know? yes and like i i see that now especially like i see that with with the the west side stuff that i grew up on and that i read about yes you know that hey well, what max effort exercise should i use you know that mm -hmm. was always the question right mm -hmm. and well you're going to try a whole bunch and you're going to see which ones work the best, mm -hmm. which ones move your indicators and which ones don't. Which rep range, you yeah. know, a lot of, you what know. percentage should I use for dynamic effort day? Well, look, here's a, here's a ballpark, <laughs> right? Yeah. Just do it. And in the next block, you're going to go, well, I, I just used 60, 60%. I wonder if I ought to try it at 65 or 55. Yeah, dude, you don't need permission. Just do it, you mm -hmm. know, and see if it worked or not. You know, like that's, I've got to watch a little bit because I think people that put out programs, they do get asked these permission questions a lot yeah. and it can get a little bit frustrating. I think people don't, maybe they don't necessarily mean to ask for permission. Maybe they're just kind of spitballing some ideas, but sometimes it seems like, Hey, uh, can I, can I do uh, two max effort days a week instead of one? Like, dude, it's your program. Do what you want. You know, if you think it's a good idea, try mm -hmm. it. And if it, if it produces better results, then do that mm -hmm. as long as it's producing. Well, the looking back where I see the, the biggest issue with the, what I was putting out there is there's a lot of gaps. There's a lot of holes. Yeah. Well, people will fill those gaps and holes with whatever they think. Right. Yeah. So one of the criticisms, which now I completely get it, like I see why it came. There's no phasic structure. And I'm like, the fuck you talking about? We have a certain thing that we do, you know, leading yeah. into the meat. Then there's all this other stuff. And things are phasing, you know, like the supplementals are phasing at different cadences yeah. than the other stuff. But there is. Yeah. But I'm not saying that, you know, yeah, so if yeah. you're not if you're not explaining. Yeah. So those not what's the how's that go? You can't talk about what you don't know yeah you know so not even knowing what you don't know you know right. creates gaps that other people you know come and fill sure and then it ends up being not what it really is yeah. you know but how do you fill in those gaps when it's kind of auto-regulated yeah you know? well i think i've done that a little bit too that you know i've kind of assumed that people would like start out with that knowledge of you know, well, start at, uh, start at lower intensity and work your way toward higher intensity as just like a, a default sort of response. 
you know? Yeah. And, you know, if you figure out, because we've definitely run into people who don't respond to that. So <laughs> if you don't respond to it, then definitely do something else. Yeah. But at first you don't know. So you need something mm -hmm. to get you started. So that seemed to be a reasonable place to start. But a lot of people, especially in the last couple of years, have come in seemingly not knowing that, you know, and I think like, well, that's, that's my fault because I'm not teaching it that way. You know, I'm teaching it like it's this bottom up process. You just you find the greatest hits and you know, yeah, 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 you should do that. That's the process, but uh, you've got to overlay that on some background knowledge, I think, you know, and, and I've, what I've done more recently is grown, grown in my appreciation for that background knowledge a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know, background knowledge is examples of just like studying some more of the like block periodization or any of the top down planning models just so that's not that you're going to implement that directly but just so that it's operating in the background you know do you have a basis for some of the decisions that you're going to make or even just exercise science more broadly that it, not that you should apply any of it without thinking but just that it should give you ideas, you know, like, Hey, I read, uh, you know, I, I, the consensus seems to be, uh, pushing more training volume is better for hypertrophy. And I'm getting ready to start this hypertrophy block, you know, well, okay, that's operating in the background. These are some principles for you to make decisions, you know, in the absence of information, mm -hmm. uh, specific information about this athlete's response. But if you've got specific information on this athlete's response, that trumps all the other stuff. You know, yeah, on average, uh, you know, highly specific practice makes makes the most sense. It's uh, uh, on paper, at least, or with certain populations, you know, pushing a high frequency of highly specific practice is going to give you the best return on your on your time investment here in terms of one RM strength. Well, that's great, except for the people that don't respond to that, you know, or the people uh, who could have a better response by tweaking some of these variables in a little bit different way. You know, like, for example, uh, I've noticed a lot lately guys who are, you know, more veteran in their career. I've just been picking a number that's a total wag, but uh, I've been saying around 15 years training mm -hmm. age. Like, that's not that's not the way for those guys. Like you can't just push more volume, push more volume. In fact, or you see the opposite. Hey, let's pull the volume way back. Let's not even touch the competition list. Let's do a bunch of other stuff, Yeah. you know? And then when we get to the peaking block, maybe we add in a little bit of it and we see big, much better results than the push more volume. You think a piece of, thing. of that is because their skill acquisition is acquisition yeah. is already really high. Yeah. Like how much is your squat form exactly. really going to change? Exactly. You know, and I mean, they've been doing this, the same pattern, all this specific practice for, you know, yes. a decade and a half, you know, yeah, it's this diminishing marginal benefit idea. Like how much are you going to improve by doing yet another session of the competition lift? Whereas we could mix things up a little bit still get a training effect, uh, still maintain the stuff that we need to maintain, and it's not beating up their joints. It's not. Isn't you know, that kind of what you accident, accidentally stumbled across yeah. and did well, <laughs> yeah. after you, yeah. for the last six years? Yeah, yeah, you know, definitely. So talk about that a little bit. So your, your hip, back, or whatever got yeah. all fired up, right? Yeah, so th it started around that, I mentioned that competition in 2014. Um, like if anybody should know better, it should be me, right? But oh, that's all yeah, but, <laughs> but you know, I'm training for this, and I kind of got sucked into this idea of like, uh, I've got to do more work than that guy, you mm -hmm. know, okay. and uh, I've got to work harder than anybody else in the room. I mean, it's it's good up to a point, but I went well past that point, you know. And long story short, I started to get this pain. They would, it was in my hip every time I would lock out a squat or a deadlift. And uh, it just started getting worse. I got through this competition, took some time off, and it would be better for a session or two than it would get worse again. And that led to like this two-year period of 
take a little time off, then come back, take a little time off, try to work around it. Uh, that didn't work or it worked for a little while, but then it got worse again, you know, just fighting it for like two years. And in the meantime, competition results are getting worse and worse and it's frustrating. And I did one competition that was terrible, you know, and I said, look, I'm not signing up for another one until I get this sorted out. Mm -hmm. And I didn't sign up for one for six years. And it probably didn't need to be that long. Uh, but what happened for me is I said, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do anything that hurts. So no squats, uh, no deadlifts, uh, no really anything hinging, like hinging itself was fairly limited, uh, because like good mornings, anything like that mm -hmm. was going to hurt. Uh, so what can I do? Well, I can front squat, I can front squat as heavy as I want. And it was no problem. I can do stuff like leg pressing and I could still bench. So I picked three things that I decided to care about. Uh, bench was fine. And I said, I'm going to, I'm actually going to care about my front squat now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to care about pull-ups. Uh, so that became my three competition lifts. Mm -hmm. and, and I, same process, just optimized to slightly different things. And uh, it got to where I had developed some front squat goals and they became important to me, but really mm -hmm. nobody else. No, <laughs> yeah, I, sure, I get this more oh, than yeah. you think. Oh, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but yeah, I probably could have kind of angled back and returned to the platform sooner than I did. But, you know, I wanted the, wanted the front squat 600 and yeah. I wanted the, you know, that mattered to me. So I decided to continue pursuing that. Um, but then eventually it's like, well, I gotten healthy enough where I, I said, look, I think I could manage both of these things at the same time. And that worked pretty well, actually. I think what, what you're talking about is the, that's how I've been able to transition away from actually the competing is yeah. outside of trying the bodybuilding crap and all the other stuff, which mm -hmm. just didn't satisfy that need yeah. of to strain. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how else to explain it. It's just that yeah. need to to strain yeah. is I'll find movements, you know, like your front squat mm -hmm. and then commit to it. Like, yeah. Here's what I want to do on this. Right. And I'm going to train this exactly the same way I would if it was the, right. you know, a squat bench or deadlift. And then it brings that whole process yeah. back in. Cause it's more than just lifting the thing. It's thinking about how you're going to lift more exactly. of the thing, yeah. how you're going to recover. It's that whole thing yeah. that, you know, gets locked into our brains, you know, or whatever it is for that. And uh, at what point uh, there's you said that there were there are other reasons that delayed you coming back. Mm -hmm. Was that children, kids uh, work a little bit, but not not a huge amount. So for me, I'm lifting weights, I'm training and uh, it's looking like bench training is what bench training has always been. Squats focused on front squats, right? So you gotta, you gotta tell me what that is, because <laughs> I probably feel the same way. It is what it uh, is, right? I mean, I wasn't limited by <laughs> any sort of injuries. I'm trying my best. <laughs> yeah, bench, no, I, I get it. I bench get it. is stubborn, man. Yeah, God, I know. It's been stubborn. Yeah, it's not like a squat. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's mm. somewhat less satisfying for mm -hmm. a guy who's good at deadlifts. Anyway, that, use that as an excuse. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, so I, I, my lower body training especially is focused around front squatting you know but i would say all right it's time to start reintroducing back squats and, and deadlifts so the way that i want to do that is start super super light and add at a very slow increment like 10 pounds a week five pounds a week something like that and so i would program it in that way but then you'd get busy i get busy and that's the first thing that would get cut out you know, mm -hmm. like, oh man, I'm really pressed for time. I got to go pick up the kids and blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm not going to have time to do my rehabby squats today, but it's only, you know, 250 pounds for a set of five. Like who cares, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, whatever, I'll get it tomorrow. And then I would skip it for like three or four weeks. And then you go, well, shit, I guess I should really start over. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? And so there were a few failed attempts like that until I figured out that for me, especially in those early stages, I just needed to include it as part of my warm up for front squats, the, the meat mm -hmm. and potatoes of the program, because it wasn't taxing and it just fit, right? And this is part of that, you know, is there like a physiological principle for that? No, it's strictly logistics. It's strictly mm -hmm. convenience, you know, making it make sense. 
So uh, I was including it in, as part of my warm up until it got heavy enough that it's like, okay, this is actually requiring a little bit of attention. And then it was heavy enough that I could put it in its own spot in the program. And it, was, it, it would have enough of my attention that I would actually do it. Mm -hmm. you know, and then it got to be, well, it's, it's only like one hard set of squats, you know, it's one set of 10 or something like that. But it was a, it was a hard set. And then uh, you'd go from like one set of 10 down to two sets of five and then three sets of three, you know, just increasing the weight slowly. And then when it would get to be a, you know, a fairly hard set, you would, you know, cut the reps. Uh, maybe you would add a set or maybe not depending on the, the relative volume. But, you know, but by, by the time you're doing a decent three sets of three, look, you're, that's real training, you know? Um, but the fight for me at that point was don't say, okay, I'm, you know, bless it and say, I'm, I'm healed now. Mm -hmm. Go back to a regular powerlifting program. That would not have been the, the move. It's just take the next step. You can never go back to the thing that you did before you take the next step from here. And maybe that leads to something that looks similar to how it used to, or maybe not, you know, and I w went to the first competition. Uh, the first competition back was last March and I was doing like uh, two or three working sets a week for squats and maybe one or two working sets a week for deadlifts. And I was doing other stuff. I was still front squatting. I was still doing, you know, accessory work for legs just broadly and uh, hip extension and stuff like that. But as far as like actually training the competition movements, it, it wasn't that much and it led to a pretty good result. I mean, it wasn't a personal best total in the first one back, but I was proud of how I did. No, it's, it's in striking range for the it second is. or third one back for it, sure. Yeah. Right. Cause yeah. it was only 20 kilos, maybe under each lift. I think it was about 15 for each lift, but even that on the total, I think it was only like uh 35, 40 kilos off on the total. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's like... Did you expect that? I didn't realize it. I, I ex got about what I expected, especially yeah. like as we got yeah. closer to the meet. But I didn't I didn't realize that it was so close until uh, until afterwards. I was like, oh, actually, that's pretty good. I'm, I'm okay with how I did, you know? Mm -hmm. so. Do you think going in with more limited expectations yielded a more positive result? I can't say that it hurt me, Yeah, you know, and this is another thing that I'm still trying to make sense of, <laughs> you know, because like, it's so counterintuitive, right? Like you're supposed to go into the comp and, and like, you know, overcome it through force of will. Like I'm mm -hmm. going to lift a PR because I decided to, it shit don't work that way, mm -hmm. you know? So like this competition, especially for squat and deadlift, I had, I think I had worked up to my opener, but nothing heavier than that in literally years mm -hmm. you know so i had no idea really where the top end was we we're going to do the opener and kind of eyeball it after that yeah. you know so uh on the squat I, it worked great you know i got within a reasonable distance of a limit lift on on squat and deadlift and it was so fun it was so fun to do that uh bench on the other hand i had a lot more clear expectations for the bench and it wasn't off by much, uh, but it was not nearly as fun, <laughs> mm -hmm, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And I can't think of it being anything other than the difference in expectation. And I, and I go, what do I do with that? You know, does that mean that, you know, I should limit my expectations as I go into these competitions? Cause it didn't seem to hurt my performance, but then how do you do that? You know, once training starts to look a little bit more normal and you you would have to pretty intentionally not see, you know, where the top end is, you know, it, it would be hard not to see. Well, couldn't you, you just know? underestimate your RPEs, you know, instead of what you normally would think you would have to do at a nine, you just do it at eight. Does that make sense? Yeah, you could. I mean, I, I guess I would think that that'll affect. Cause I would think that, I mean, it's always hypothetical sure. that your your carryover, you know, from your training max to competitive max mm -hmm. was way higher than you th expected it to be. 
is that an outlier you know or do you see you see it <laughs> I, well i'm the kind of lifter that uh i perform about how i expect to in competition maybe a little bit worse which is not ideal mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I think part of it is environment you know like i'm most of my training time i'm by myself in the basement and you get really used to getting focused and uh bringing the right amount of energy in that environment and then you move to a different environment and it's hard to get the same type of focus you know and maybe it's only off by a very tiny tiny bit but that'll make a difference, a noticeable difference when you're talking about limit lifts, mm -hmm. you know? So, I, I mean, that's one thing that I think is worth overcoming. You know, I got to get out of the basement a little bit more, you know, and meet prep, you know, and train around some other people. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, are there any other big takeaways? I know you're still processing the whole thing, but yeah. what are the, what are some of the other ones like that, that popped out? Yeah. I, I think that was probably the big one for me is like, what do I do with these, you know, expectations or lack of expectations. Um, and I mean, over the course of the last several years, I've been thinking about like, what's my goal for going to a meet? And actually it was one of our clients who um, was saying like his goal is to go to the meet and represent himself and his training well, you know? And I mean, that sounds really abstract and, and maybe not all that hardcore, <laughs> mm -hmm. but like that resonates with me is like, if I go there and I want to represent myself, my training well, that I'm going to make good decisions. I'm going to lift the most weight that I can. I'm going to perform to the best of my ability. And look, if it's not there for reasons that are beyond your control, then hey, that's how it goes. If Dennis Cornelius shows up and he blows my total weight, that's outside of my control. You know, but if I do my job, then I should perform well. And the rest should take care of itself, you know. Are you worried at all of, this is, give me a different type of question, mm -hmm. because I know you worked really hard, you know, to build reactive training systems kind of separate from your name, yeah. you know, that, because for a long time it just was tied into that. Yeah. And what did happen over the last few years is that was able to take on more meaning and more yeah. brand just by itself. Yeah. Are you worried that with what you just said, you get back in there to represent that training that you're going to have to now mitigate that? Yeah. I mean, it's a double-edged sword, I think. No, it is. Yeah, because I think it'll be, from a business standpoint, it'll be good in terms of garnering attention. Yes. That's the fact of running a business. Yeah. Right? But it, it'll be bad from the perspective of what you're talking about like trying to separate uh my even just like my personal brand from the business brand because like i know at some point i, I do want to hang it up i want it to be its own thing yes. i want it to be separate from from mm -hmm. me the lifter uh so it will make that process harder so it's a short term <laughs> I guess, yeah, solution, yeah yeah right? yeah i mean how have you been able to maintain the the quality of coaching mm -hmm. throughout the coaches that you have not only you didn't maintain it actually got better you mm -hmm. know because of that yeah so what speaking business wise you know yeah. what how did you navigate that because well, i do think it's important to stay connected to the sport yes like, and and like even from that like i always want to coach because i think if i were to step back and just be uh you know a mentor to the coaches and just manage the business side of things. I think it's easy to get disconnected from like ground level what's going mm -hmm. on here, you know, but I'd actually be curious to, to hear from you. Like, how did you manage it? Like, was it a, a process for you in terms of brand? hundred percent. I mean, anytime I in intuition, I suppose, yeah. anytime I'd feel like my voice has become too big for the brand, I, I, basically vanish you know oh, I, just, yeah? I, I would i would not completely silence it but mute it and then put more of the emphasis on the the columnists the writers you know, athletes you know whatever from from the content piece mm -hmm. you know i'd go that route and then but it is always on your mind yeah. you know because it's more so probably for me because we don't sell content you know it's so yeah. it's just you know if we were monetizing the content then it would be kind of a different you know, a different yeah. realm where 
I have to, the biggest problem that I run into is people don't realize we sell products, <laughs> you know, and so that, yeah, that becomes a big issue, you know, where you have, you know, all uh, followers or whatever you want to call it, you know, attention mm-hmm. of people, but then they're like, well, what do you, what, what do you do? And what yeah. they don't know, right. you know, so that be it. So it's not so much the, there's two pillars, you know, so there's my name, you know, that I got to watch how, the, how that manages. And at the same time, keep reminding people that we actually sell products, <laughs> you know, because yeah. it's, that's the, the trick with that, where in going back through the years, there were, because content changes, you know, yeah. it was used to just be Q and A's and, you know, an article and then it became more blogging and now it's more video audio type of stuff Yeah, where I can remember taking my uh, training log down, you know, pulling off of the Q and A, mm-hmm. you know, and then pushing, you know, other people more forward if I felt it, you know, yeah. it's, I can't well, tell cool you there's that, no indicator. I mean, that's cool that it's a, like a, a intuitive kind of approach and, and a deliberate one at that, you know, that yes. it's, I don't know, it's, it's easy to, uh, I don't know, get caught up in it, I think too. You like, could, but like yourself, cause you're reminding yourself that at some point in time, yeah. You know, you're you're not going to be competing. Well, right. You know, most of the business I haven't been competing, mm-hmm. you know, but at that same time, it's, you know, it's reminding, you know, at some point in time, you're going to get older. At some mm-hmm. point in time, your voice isn't going to matter as much because, you know, for me, I now became the guy on the other side. You are, too, in a way. You become the guy on the other yeah. side of the table, right? Yeah. So now you're right. sitting at Bob Evans talking to that. 20 year old powerlifter sure. saying the same shit the 40 some year old guys were telling us <laughs> knowing all and well that they're like shut up old yeah. fuck you don't you, yeah. now that you're competing it's different because you can say I just out told your ass sure. but we're that guy now yeah. you know and if, but I I'm hoping the difference is we realize we're that guy you know so <laughs> then you can still look yeah. and see what the mindset is because yeah. it changes over time right mm-hmm. with I'm positive you know when you were competing in your early years it's comp- different than when you were competing oh, yeah. in your later years yeah um talk about that a little bit just from your mindset standpoint throughout yeah. the yeah I 20 mean, years or whatever i think probably the biggest piece of it is what i mentioned is like my motivation change of focus on winning versus focus on uh, I mean, it sounds so lame to say doing my best, but, mm-hmm. but I mean, in a sport like powerlifting, it's very obvious that that's all you've got. You know, there's no hidden tactic that you can employ. You know, I mean, there's very little you can do there. Um, it's, you put forward your best total, uh, and that's, that's what you got for the day, you know, and the rest of it is trying to build that up. So I, I've sent several messages to lifters, who are kind of in that same second place podium Mm -hmm. looking grumpy sort of position that try to, you know, what you're saying too is uh, try to give them a little perspective. Like, Hey man, I appreciate where you're at. I know, you know, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow. It's not what you wanted, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, try to appreciate it a little bit, try to look around, try to have some long-term perspective and say, Hey, you know, this is maybe not what I wanted, but it's still pretty cool. Mm-hmm. You know, just, yeah. So how have your priorities shifted since competing as a collegiate to now? Man, uh, I don't think powerlifting has ever been like number one in my life. You know, I've uh, uh, pretty much right after I graduated, I got married. So uh, like having a family was always part of the picture. But now we've got four kids, and that's definitely, man, I appreciate so much, like, guys who are, you know, have a, they've got a real job, and they're doing this on their free time, you know, that's tough, you know, I at least get to make it part of my work day, yeah. you know, and, uh, yeah, guys who are just kind of finding a way to fit it in, that's a, that's a hardcore way to go, um, yeah, if I didn't, if I didn't have the opportunity to make it part of my work day, then it'd be hard pressed to still be an active competitor. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. How has the pri- how has the priority shifted though? Because not always yeah. the first. Where let's say it was a heavy second, sure, or third. Yeah, you know, it, it obviously wasn't that while you were doing the well, 
the front squat. Maybe it was, you know, because it still is the training, right? Sure, it's not sure. so much powerlifting, but the yeah. training. Yeah. I mean, I've heard some coaches talk about like how they uh, had to step back from competing in order to focus on their coaching. And I don't really feel like those two things compete for me very much. Yeah. I mean, a training, look, I'm a human being, so I need to do some kind of exercise anyway. Uh, may as well be something I enjoy in the training. So it takes a couple hours out of your day. You know, if you're managing the workload, yeah, you shouldn't need to coach 24 seven. No, I don't, know. I don't understand that either. Yeah. So I, I don't quite get that, but, um, so I'm fortunate that wherever it has been, I mean, it's still pretty high on my priority list, but, uh, um, you know, it's definitely come down a bit, you know, as my family's grown, um, and you know, we try to, you know, you got to take care of the needs of, of others, you know, mm-hmm. and sometimes very rarely, you know, I'll have some other business thing that you know, has to be attended to and that'll interfere with, with training. But for the most part, I'm fortunate that since it's, since I've got the freedom of scheduling that I do, uh, that I'm, I'm able to find a way to fit it in. But, you know, like the, we were talking in the very beginning about my kickboxing mm-hmm. <laughs> my short lived stint of kickboxing that was actually how that ended you know I'm doing it having a great time it's super fun and I came across there was like a, a month where I had a bunch of travel going to competitions to coach and maybe I forget what all it was seminars and whatever um, and I couldn't go to any of these practices for like a month and when I got back you know you got to play catch up at home and you know and it just kind of fell off and never went back and I'm like man I see how this happens to people you know I'm much I feel like I'm much more able to relate Mm -hmm. you know Uh, if you haven't just like really built it in to be part of who you are I can see how it would fall off it could but I think there's 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 obviously I don't know how to explain there's certain people that have this wired in our brain some fucked up way right i can't that's the only way i know but there's just some fucked up thing where certain people just are they like to strain yeah for whatever reason you know and it's, that's like way down in your dna at this point right? i think so yeah. i and i think it's just locked in you know yeah. to certain people and so when it comes to those things of you know the having to dial back on the training because they are more into the coaching, you know, mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's, I kind of like, I, uh, how, you know, like yeah. I thought that I thought we were doing the coaching so we can still do the training, <laughs> you know, you, yeah, you yeah. see, you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it, like the job and all the work is so we can still train. Well, and even I, at that, like I, I, it has to make you better. You know, I don't understand how, like if you just stop training completely, like how, how do you continue to grow? I don't know. You know. Yeah. That's why I won't. Yeah. You know, maybe we're wrong, you know, but I don't know. I, I have a choice. Well, I mean, I wouldn't. I I can tell you like I've I know where my creative process comes from and I see that, you know, I have whatever problems that occur in in sort of in a coaching context and lots and lots of times ideas for solutions come in a training session. Mm-hmm. And I they don't come at other times, you know, and so if you were to cut out those training sessions or change them in mm-hmm. some significant way. I don't know that it happens the same way anymore, you know? I mean, and I'm definitely still learning stuff about how individuals respond to mm-hmm. training or, you know, try still trying to build a little bit better mousetrap. Is there any example that you can give of a time that you were training and it was like, boom, you know, <laughs> something hit that was like a big one that... Man, while I was training, I mean, usually it's not so much a boom, but... Uh, I get a lot of like tactical ideas for training while training, you know, like uh, we're having this kind of problem in the bench press. So what if, you know, bar path issue in the bench press. So what if we tried maybe a a very slight incline, you know, and I mean, turned out that was, that was one that worked, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, I'm sure those ideas have their seeds somewhere else, something that I heard somebody say somewhere else, but it kind of comes to fruition. It comes to like, how are we going to implement this? Mm -hmm. It comes in a, in a training session. Well, the tinkering around too, you know, can 
spawn a lot of ideas. Yeah, like, where is it going to fit in the week? Like, well, what if we put it there? Well, no, that doesn't look right now. So, you know, j- yeah, just like doodling almost, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Are there any other ones that pop to your head that... Yeah, the, the bench one is one. I mean, lots of lots of protocols for different things, you know, like... We'll, uh, this time we did, you know, doing a, a metabolic focused training block and you're doing maybe uh, 70% with 30 second rest intervals up to a certain point. And you go, well, that's really too short. That's, you know, I'm not, it doesn't feel the way that I, it's supposed to feel, you know. So let's go 75% with one minute instead or something along those lines, right? How do you, how do you make that observation if you're not there doing it? Because you know? mm-hmm. it looks right on paper, and, but then you do it and you go, oh, wait, that's not exactly what I'm going for. So you, you fiddle with it a little bit. But I can't imagine that fiddling coming from, I mean, sooner or later it's going to have to, right? Like you can't, like we said, at some point we're going to hang it up, mm-hmm. you know? So... Uh, I've thought about that too. I thought, well, maybe you but hang what up though, you know, training. Cause we can always train. Well, fair enough. Right. Like you find, find a way, find the movement, even if it's, even if it's limited in some way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's fair enough. Right. But I don't know. I, I mean, I know there always, yeah, I know there'll always, I know there'll always be a time that you'll, you'll, li- you will lift your heaviest squat. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, I don't think any of sure. us ever really know when that <laughs> time, you know, or the lift, but right. And I, there'll be a time that you'll do your last meet. Most mm-hmm. of the time you don't know, you mm-hmm. know, when that's going to be either. But I don't know if there's ever going to be a time you're going to well, act when you die. You know what I'm saying? When <laughs> right. you walk out of the gym for the last time. Sure. But I don't think for, you know, a lot of us, that's going to be one of those things where we're like four years removed. And we're like, oh, man, I never realized when I yeah. walked out of the gym that day, it was going to be the last right. time. Yeah. You know, it's just I think it's just too ingrained. It's in your house you know so it's you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah, you, you yeah. might walk through you, right, know, you yeah. may not use it but you're going to still be there yeah. you know and it's going to be you know the smell of the rubber smell of the plates kind of like you know. well, i mean that's fair enough too and, and i mean like i can look at my dad and he's not really lifting weights as much anymore but you know he's also in the 70s so i mean do you still want to be a coach when you're in your seventies? I, I don't know. I mean, you wouldn't want to have to coach. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. 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 Right? So, I mean, it might amount to being prepared for stuff that is unlikely to pass. Mm-hmm. That's definitely a thing. With your programming, mm-hmm. where, where do the accessories you like for, for myself, I'll have things that I'll call supplemental exercises sure. and then accessories. And I distinguish them differently. Mm -hmm. The supplemental exercises are three to fives, you know, kind of in that range. The accessories are the 10 to 15, just crap that you probably don't need to do, but it's there because maybe it helps. Who knows? So there's less emphasis. Um, How do you define and structure the accessories that go into the training? I definitely place less of an emphasis on that than a lot of my contemporaries do, I think. But I try to make up for it with like we'll still train that intensity zone but i'll do it with compounds you know if i've let's take the bench for example if i want to focus in on triceps development then we'll do a a close grip uh bench of some variety in place of or Um, after that movement well so like i'll have a in terms of exercise classification you know of course there's a competition lift yes and then to um to use, I think to use your terminology, we'll have the supplemental movements, uh, and then accessory movements would be, for me, a lot of times train. They're going to be similar movements, just trained for more reps. You know, so you, you could do a close grip bench, for you know heavy three five mm-hmm. rep range, and that's going to give you more of like the supplemental types of effects, mm-hmm. or you could do twelve to fifteen, or you can use a really close grip. Uh, and that'll give you more of like what you would get from a yeah. supplemental movement uh, with the added benefit of like if we're talking about close grip bench you're still getting some training volume on the pecs on the delts yes and they're just focused in on the triceps so that's kind of how i've addressed it up to this point but why that is it because of the specificity of the movement or it's just 
easier because it's less equipment somebody needs to use and yeah less less equipment that's needed uh more time efficient i mean i guess you could argue that it brings more fatigue in yes um but i mean to get the similar to get a similar volume uh, you would need to do you know two or three different isolation yeah. movements and you know is your three sets of close grip bench uh really more fatiguing than three sets of tricep extensions and uh three sets sets of machine pressing or, or flies or whatever you're doing mm-hmm. uh plus three sets of front raises you think well i don't know that sounds like a lot you know it, it probably yeah. balances out you know? it becomes an issue when you're trying to calculate total volume though too yeah. because total volume of what because when well, that, you, you that, say that's where it gets that's foggy. A, i mean that is definitely a problem and i think i i never like to allow the math of training to influence what would be like good training decisions right so it seems wrong to me to say um like if we were to to talk it through and we said no actually those isolation movements would be better but let's not do that because we have trouble calculating the volume for it that seems like a wrong yeah, uh, yeah, wrong yeah, choice yeah. right but it is a factor mm-hmm. you know like yeah it would be wrong to make the decision that way but it that is part of it you know calculating that is an, an important part of writing the program you know so you know i think you could do it but you also run into problems with it. Like, well, okay, they uh, did their triceps extensions, then they ran out of time and had to had to go, you know. So uh, they didn't get to the the last the front yeah. raises and the pec stuff. So, so now what? You know, well, uh, we need to make up for that. Well, you don't have to, but the the hundred percent correct answer would be to make up for that in some way. Um, you know, not just bumping the sets to the next mm-hmm. session, but you, there's this adjustment process to go through, but, um, you would want to adjust it, uh, but it gets messy. You know? It's really messy because it becomes another stimulus that you need to recover from. Right. You know, and do you just wash it out and say, well, they're just hypertrophy sets of eight to 10, no big deal. And just discount Cause you can't do that either. That never sits well with me. <laughs> right. Like, it, that's the that's the answer that most yeah. in my experience most coaches will will do i mean we do it with all kinds of stuff right like oh you missed the training session we'll just pick it back up from where we left off and keep it going uh or you know nutrition like oh you went over on uh you went over on carbs this day uh so I'll just pretend that didn't happen and pick it back up where you left off i mean i get that there's reasons to do that um but if you're talking about a dedicated athlete who's not dealing with some psychological stuff going on and um, that had more to do with the nutrition aspect, I think, but uh, from a training standpoint, I think a lot of it is getting bogged down in the math of it, you know, like, well, okay, so they missed some of this, but not that. So I've got to recalculate how I do all this. Well, I mean, that's a lot to manage, you know, and, Mm -hmm. I mean, too much to manage. And I can't, I don't really blame guys for not wanting to do that. And they go, well, look, the simplest thing is just to pretend it didn't happen and move on. Um, but that, I don't think that's the 100% correct answer. Right? No, it's not. And it does, you know, in somewhere in super training, there's, there's a section in there that lays out how to lay out a training log, right? Mm-hmm. Calculate the total sets and reps in each intensity zone and lay it out, you know, and I, I did that for yeah. like a year and a half, yeah. you know, so you got the max effort zone, the dynamic, there are different intensities. So whatever you want to call it, it's just different intensity zones. And it's like, holy, like, it's this, this is mind numbing because yeah. this accessory zone, you know, 60% under, you know, it's got a, a very large workload yeah. for stupid shit, you know, and does that have an impact on the main stuff? And is it positive or negative? And I don't know because I got this other crap in here, right? You know, which is the supplemental, which which is doing what? And it just becomes mind numbing, yeah. you know, where it seems like what you've done is stripped it down to the basics to be able to actually look and see. 
well, one I mean, has more still, correspondence. And there's still plenty to look at too, right? But one way that I've tried to address that is uh, through the training log that, that we'll use. Because there gets to be so much, you know, especially if you're trying to do this by hand. You know, because <laughs> like you're talking about calculating your volume in these intensity zones. But then think like you could also subdivide that by muscle group in each intensity zone. You could also subdivide that by movement pattern, you know, and like there's so many different ways to slice it. It's, it's impossible. You've got mm -hmm. to make some decisions on what are the important things to look at and what's just noise. You always have to do that, but a computer can help you look at a lot more stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and when we moved our training log online, that was a big benefit. And uh, so now what we'll do is we'll log our training on the, the RTS website and at the end of each block, we have this process, we'll do a block review. Uh, and it kind of looks at the training in that training block and uh, kind of gives you a summary. So kind of step one there is you collect these block reviews, right? And then you're getting ready for your competition. You can say, you can pull your, your three, five, whatever you want, your best blocks. Yeah. And you can say, what are the commonalities here? Okay, they all have, you know, bench trained you know three to five reps at eight to nine rpe they all have chest level pin pressing they all have triceps extension whatever whatever you notice you know and then kind of a step beyond that there's a, a another tool we built called a meta block review that looks at all your block reviews and says okay based on what we see here uh these exercises average you know the the peak bench performance these exercises average the best gain over the course of the block and so on. So you can look and see best exercises, uh, if there's any sort of um, um, like volume level that is better correlated or not. It's just to help you get actionable data mm -hmm. from the training log that you're doing. And it, it helps because it reduces how much uh, manual entry stuff you've got to do. Yes. Yeah. And it does it show the the inverse. Well, so it will yeah. show the negative. Yeah, yeah. So hey, this exercise is is poorly correlated, or yeah. or you get noise in there too, right? Like you've got one block that was really great, and five blocks that were terrible. You know, well, how does that shake out? Well, it's probably not great. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so and what did that could could that have block created the preceding five terrible? Right. Ones? Yeah. Right. Or you and you can do that by collecting that training data over time. And I mean, that's been some, I mean, I've heard you talk about yeah. this before, like your, your training log isn't just dear diary today. I lifted weights today. You know, it's, it's supposed to teach you something. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to do is to make this thing so that it does a better job of teaching me about my own training. When you get into the weeds with all this, yeah. so outside of the sets and the reps, mm -hmm. You know, what are some of the other variables that you see um, your clients or just people in general just screwing up? The things they don't like the nutrition you tapped on a little yeah. bit. But what are some of the other ones that it doesn't like it doesn't really matter? Man, you know, it, I mean, I'm sure not news to you, but life stress is a big yeah. one. Um, and people aren't aware of that. Like you'll talk to clients and um, say you've got a block that didn't go to plan and you're trying to figure out the reason why like hey this should have worked it didn't and you're talking to them like hey you got a lot of life stress going on anything no no everything seems fine you know but you talk to them a little bit more and they're going through a divorce and you know, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. like, like what do you mean everything's no this is not normal i mean i don't think they're lying about it they're just it feels normal enough to them it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like it's impacting training but you know, sometimes it's hard to, to notice that, that type mm -hmm. of thing, you know, what, ha, if you know that, yeah. what would be your adjustment? Would you, would you lower the overall volume or would you, I mean, yeah. I, I don't like the word deload. I mean, how would you accommodate that? Yeah. Um, I mean, if it's a short term thing, yeah, you can just, uh, like we would call it a, a pivot, but, um, uh, deloaded or pivot or whatever, uh, period of, short period of reduced training load uh, and then get back to it but if it's going to be something that's more of a long-term thing maybe you do have to reduce the the overall training stress and that can come in a couple different ways you know you can reduce the volume you can reduce the intensity or some combination there 
um, we calculate a number that we call the stress index that looks at um, the the weight on the bar, how many reps you're doing, how hard is the set, um, and tries to combine that into like one number uh, for like think of it like what's the recovery impact of this mm-hmm. thing that I'm doing, you know? So uh, you might do you know three sets of three at a nine RPE, but if you're doing sets of three at an eight RPE, you might need to do you know four sets. Uh, to make up for that slight Mm -hmm. reduction in in effort, you know, so um, we know kind of what stress index level people can, well, the other important thing to point out is uh, where volume is intensity dependent, it's intensity specific, so like a high volume workout at 80% is a lot less than a high volume at, at 60%, right? The stress index is pretty stable, you know, if we're training at 80%, we're training at 60%, you know, you can recover from about what you can recover from, you know. So, like, I know right now my bench is sitting around a 20 per week. Um, and whether I'm training low volume or, or low intensity or high intensity, high effort or low effort, it's going to sit around a 20. What do you mean 20? Is your stress index? Yep. Okay. Yep. So, you take somebody, you know that about them. And mm-hmm. now, you know, take my situation. Hey, you're going to be living in a hotel room for three months and it's going to be this, you know, nasty situation. So, um, maybe you proactively reduce that. We could say, Hey, let's drop it from, let's drop it 15%. We'll go from 20 to uh, 17. I think it's 15% Mm -hmm. math in public. Right. But you drop it a few points and say, okay, let's, let's see how this shakes out. You know, are we having anything that looks like recovery issues? No. Okay. Let's sit tight or yeah, we're still, not recovering the way that we want to maybe we need to drop it more or it's just a, a way of doing load management that's maybe well it's definitely more robust than uh you know the the other methods that i've come across you know like even it's similar to counting hard sets you know uh, which i think is a, a pretty good method it's just that easy sets don't count as zero like they're mm-hmm. not recovery free you know and uh, a set at a nine RPE, like I learned this from, from you mm-hmm. way back in the Q and a days, a set at nine RPE is a different recovery impact than a yeah. set at 10 or, you know, you do, uh, you do rest pause stuff. Like all that stuff is different recovery impact. And if you try to measure that and tease it out, then yeah, we can account for it and, and, uh, hopefully start from a better starting place. Where do you fall on the, the pivoting part? Do you fall on being proactive or being reactive? Because well, you have that metric. Yeah. So you, you could anticipate, you see what I'm saying, or yeah. you could just wait. Well, in a normal situation, um, kind of the, one of the first things that we'll do with somebody is we'll test what we call their time to peak. Uh, time to peak condition peak condition for the block, not necessarily like peak condition training for a competition. Right. Mm-hmm. So say we start working together, I'm going to build, write the program and, uh, you have a, a microcycle, like mm-hmm. usually a training week and you do that week. And then the next week is the same exercises, same sets, same reps, same RPE. The, so the weight can adjust a little bit based on performance changes, but the rest of the nuts and bolts are the same. Now, what you'll notice is that uh, there's a few things that can happen. Either performance will get a little bit better, uh, performance will be stagnant, performance will be a little bit worse. You know, so performance defined how? In terms of usually the estimated one RM. So we're looking at their competition lift. You know, uh, using that to estimate a, a max. For but them. if the if the weight's not changing that week, right? Then how right. do you know if the performance is? better or not better well we'll we'll allow the weight to change but we want the rpe to stay the same so say this block is going to be like five reps at a nine rpe just to pick something out of the air right so you're going to do your five reps at a nine rpe and then next week you're going to try to add five pounds and you're going to go yep it's still a nine or no no that was overshot a little bit on that one or whatever Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're going to repeat that week over and over and you notice these patterns start to emerge and probably the easiest thing to to start with is you know 
week two they get a little bit stronger week three they get a little bit stronger well that's going to end at some point yeah. and how long does it take for that to end you know average is five to six weeks um but we've seen people plenty of people at three weeks we've seen people go as long as like eight weeks plus but you kind of run into some other problems wouldn't that be dependent upon what the, the rpe is to start though you would think but i've found it to be pretty stable as really? long as we're keeping that stress index in the ballpark yeah you know we found it to be pretty stable across different intensity zones and rpes and whatnot uh so like for example i for the longest time i was six weeks to peak and then eventually it dropped to five but it's it was fairly stable yeah. right yeah so we'll use that to build the plan we'll say okay we're gonna train six weeks you'll get to the peak condition and then we'll we'll have a pivot block and mm-hmm. uh, for us a pivot block to start with you customize everything right mm-hmm. but to start with it's roughly a third the length of the development block and what do you mean length as far as days micro cycle sure. or volume days okay, okay. Days. so like let's say we took six weeks to to reach peak condition oh, i get you you're looking over the block uh, yeah. yeah okay yeah. okay well uh, another neat thing about this peak condition idea is it seems to be exposure dependent not necessarily time dependent Right. So what I mean by that is we're talking about a microcycle being a week. Mm -hmm. You could chop it down so that a microcycle was three or four days. Yeah. Then you get two microcycles each week. Yeah. So each lift being hit twice in a week. So if if, if it's technically six exposures to peak, Mm -hmm. that'll shorten your training block from six weeks to three three weeks. weeks. Yes. You know, now your pivot is different and so on. Yes. You know, you, the, just the caveat and i'm sure this is way too nerdy probably for podcasting but whatever um uh now your recovery is time dependent and it's not exposure dependent so when we're talking about stress index if you're if you can recover from 20 stress index per week then it's still 20. you know you can't cram a week's worth of training into three days yeah you know but it's exposure to the same stimulus so if you know, if this block is going to be benching five reps at a nine RPE uh, plus certain accessory movements, we're going to have that unit. That's a microcycle, you know, and how often does that unit repeat? You know, it may be easier to understand it as like one week's worth of training, right? Mm-hmm. So if it takes six weeks to peak, then I want to get you to that peak condition. Yeah. And like, I know for Bonnerchuk specifically, it was really important to him to get athletes to that peak condition. Like he felt strongly that uh, being in that peak condition, that's when you act, made actual improvements to your abilities. Mm-hmm. You know, like how do you improve your ability to squat a max if you're not in shape to squat a max? You know, it, I there's different things you could say about that. No, there's right? a lot, but I get where you're coming from, yeah. right? Because you can't. I, I would call it the starting line. Yeah. You, know, you can't start for some people. They can't start training for a meet mm-hmm. unless they're at 10 weeks, whatever it is. But what's that 10 weeks look like? Like what, what if you're a 700 pound squatter, that's not a 400 pound squat. Right. You know, that, right. so wherever that is has to be there. So yeah. because if it's not, then you're going to spend that whole peak the yeah. whole time just trying to get back to less than what you right. were. Right. You know, which regaining is, lost ground. Kind yeah, of which is the issue you come into when you take four years off and you have to come back. <laughs> right, right. Because you don't know, right. you know, and, but anyhow, continue. Yeah, so I guess that would be the, the thing. So technically it's a, it's a proactive deload, but it's matched up to what we see people need in the real world. Mm-hmm. You know, um, for whatever reason, you know, after that, however many exposures it takes, there's this performance decline and you know so we'll anticipate that and and uh pivot in advance of that and then d- build a different development block that's different from the first one because you want the stimulus to be different mm-hmm. what would be some of the indicators that would tell you or your your team to to break that microcycle into to put two microcycles in that one period of time if we need to peak faster is is a great one you know or uh yeah but that's risky right because if it's a higher level lifter yeah you know they're lifting a lot 
Yeah. You know, it's, and you're talking about exposing them to that more often. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you do need to be mindful of that uh, in terms of like adjusting things. And, yeah. and you might need to adjust the stress index down a little bit, but it should mostly take care of you. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if you were doing something maybe more extreme, like I, I don't push 2x frequency with like my equipped lifters, for example. This is, first of all, how does your skin take it? You know, yeah, how could yeah. you get in a bench shirt twice a week? You know, some people do it, but I think it's pretty loose shirt. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the weight's heavier too, so the neural demand is going to yeah. be higher. Yeah. I mean, that's so I wouldn't do it just with anybody Mm -hmm. you know but if you've got somebody that you know is tolerating the volume pretty well they're already using a pretty high frequency of like exposure to the Mm -hmm. the muscles and the movements uh then it's more of like shifting the pieces around on the board instead of like adding new pieces you know to what degree of freedom are you going to shift those pieces and in in other words would you shift those to five exposures per week i have never done that i I think i've done three exposures per week myself once Mm -hmm. i've never done that with a with a client um but like like i said my peak time to peak was six exposures so you do three x well in two weeks you're done yeah you know but i mean people have definitely done it like you think of the bulgarian Mm -hmm. daily one rm crews uh, and I remember a friend of mine, Mike Zordos, was doing Daily 1RM. He did some research on Daily 1RM. And he was talking about, like, a two-week rhythm where they would notice, like, uh, like, their, like over the course of, like, two weeks, they would have some, like, really low performances and really high performances. You know, and I don't know. That maybe isn't exactly what I'm looking mm-hmm. at, but it's a similar, similar sort of rhythm, you know. What about going in the other direction to where it'd be one exposure yeah. every two weeks? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we'd probably pull that lever a lot more. Yeah. Um, especially you've got somebody with recovery issues, uh, especially like lift specific recovery issues. Like, Hey, I can't, I can't deadlift that often. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll deadlift once you know, we'll deadlift this week and then next week it's something different, you know, or, um, you get some lifters that like more variety. You know, and speaking of variety, like one idea uh, that this this system might sound boring, on, like at a surface level, right? Because yeah. it's like the same week of training over and over. Well, if you're getting stronger and the weight is getting heavier each week, it's that's not boring. It's not boring at no, all. No, that's fun. Yeah. And now when you hit the peak condition and the weights aren't going up anymore. Yeah, it gets boring in a hurry, mm-hmm. but now it's time to change anyway. Yeah. So no big deal. You know, so I, at first, like when I was first sketching this out in my car on the side of the highway, you know, I was thinking like, man, how am I going to sell this to athletes? But it really hasn't been an issue. They haven't been bored for the most part. How many exercises would there be on an average training day? That is, I mean, it's really coach dependent. Uh, for me, I tend to write three. Yeah on most days, you know, and I tend to write more like full body, I guess, tech, whatever it's, it's like upper and lower combined. So we'll train bench pretty much on average. There's for most powerlifters, there's four training days in a week. Uh, and we're usually training bench, all of them. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, we're also training squat or deadlift on, on most of them. Rarely we'll do all three. I don't, th- there's kind of a, semi-obsession with uh, SBD days in Mm -hmm. current powerlifting. And I don't think it's necessary. You know, like I get that, you know, in some way we're preparing for the demands of competition where you're going to do all three lifts on the same day. I just, I don't see that being a limiting factor for most people that like needs specific preparation. Well, you, I understand specificity, right? But at what point is it, insane specific right because yeah. if you if you're gonna say doing all three lifts in the same day is because of specificity you know so then are you gonna say that well in a meet all the weights that you're lifting are 90 percent above and they move sure. at x speed right so that's specificity so if you're moving at any fa- week, yeah right? so if you're moving any faster than that then that's not gonna have right you know what i'm saying so that that whole i, I understand at a certain point the correspondence is going to drop to zero yeah but it, it's not like this 
plus and minus it's like an arc you know there's but there's stuff that falls on each side i think people miss that though like the dynamic correspondence is the thing that you care about the, yeah. trans, the transfer exactly. to your competition result specificity just happens to be a lens to look at the, yeah. yeah things that are more specific tend to have better transfer cool but specific isn't this is where i where we yeah. get in the weeds like specific is in how and right. the movement pattern time under tension how long you know well and from what <laughs> perspective too right like because you could be like okay if we're training if you're doing the competition lift for a one rm that yeah okay but if you back off of that from to any significant degree now there's this range of specificity like what's more specific you know a, a set of five at a 10 rpe or a set of two at a seven rpe you know well the set of two uh well maybe tweak the example a set of two at like an eight rpe so mm -hmm, well, set mm -hmm. two is going to be heavier so it's more specific from that perspective but the set of five you know that last rep is a real grinder and it's more specific from that perspective like yeah, well, there's different lenses that you can look at this through, and it just starts to unravel a little bit, starts to be less helpful. Yeah. And you, to me, I come back to, well, the thing I care about is transfer. And we can look at that. We can see, is this transferring to my competition performance or not? Yeah. So that's now, going back to the, the bench being four bouts per week, mm -hmm. is that your straight bench press, or is it a close grip one day, the regular bench one day? You know, obviously the yeah. volume and the intensity yeah. is going to change. But I, I like to have variations. I tend to I tend to train the competition lifts about once a week, sometimes yeah. twice. Uh, now that's that's me, and I tend to be on the lower frequency side from I think most of my contemporaries. But I don't know, like how else do you fit in the other stuff? I, I mean, I guess the way that they do it is that they train the competition lift and then they do a bunch of accessory stuff. Mm -hmm. I think, well, I could combine that, save some time and probably energy, improve my, you know, accounting of training volume. You know, I think there's a lot of benefit to it. You know, you got to be thoughtful about how you do it, but you got to be thoughtful anyway. Mm -hmm. So, so if that, so if it's regular bench competition yeah. bench, you know, day one, day two is, uh, light bench you know mm -hmm. i'm assuming and then day three would be a heavier version maybe a close sure. grip bench a little bit heavier yeah than so, another light so it might be like a typical pattern that that i might work out might might have the competition lift done on the competition bench done on monday uh and there might be uh an accessory movement with it uh or, I'm not sure if i'm getting my terminologies mixed up here Whatever. But, but like something like uh an overhead press or an incline press or dumbbell bench or something like that for somewhat higher reps, you mm -hmm. know, I'm thinking 10 plus, um, you know, the goal being more hypertrophy. Then the second day, a lot of times that'll be something uh, particularly heavy. Maybe we're doing uh, a board press or benching with chains or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, then Wednesday is often a rest day. Then Thursday we'll come back with something a bit more specific like a low pin press uh, or a close grip bench or something like that uh, and then friday will be um, something again like middle to high reps um, maybe a long pause bench like a five five mm -hmm. count pause bench but if you do five count that's going to be lower reps you compensate a little bit uh, and then also another accessory movement. Maybe we're doing dips or yeah. overhead press that day, you know, or something like that. So the criticism going back towards you of not having any hypertrophy work in there is false because it is. Oh in yeah, there. yeah, yeah. And I mean, even like the lower body stuff, you know, I I like to include, you know, it might be leg presses or it might be split squats or it might be something like that. But we'll train at a higher rep range. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody recently about my willingness to train um, something fairly specific like movement wise for higher reps like i'll do squats for higher reps or bench for you know 12 to 15 reps or something like that you know i, I think there's nothing wrong with that you know um, the criticism being you know stimulus to fatigue ratio kind of idea but again like uh, you'd have to compensate for it in some way you know okay you're going to do machine press you know well if it's less fatiguing, there's probably a reason why it's less fatiguing. You know, like what, why is it less fatiguing? Is it, maybe it's, 
does it really have the same stimulus? Mm -hmm. You know, I can't imagine that it's the same stimulus, you know, like how, how far in the weeds, how much detail do you want to look at it through? Because like the example that, uh, that this guy gave was, uh, you know, why would you squat for 12 reps when you could leg press for 12 reps and that'll improve your stimulus to fatigue ratio? Well, leg press isn't the same as squats, you know, like, maybe from the perspective of the quads yeah it's a it's a hard set of 12 okay but there's a lot of other stuff going on too you know like what are your what are, what's your posterior chain doing like what about technically you know so the it's all these other muscles that are also active mm -hmm. and there's a reason that it's a different movement if it was the same movement it would be the same movement but yeah, it's not yeah so. <clears throat> so then when you get to those two questions with the accessories, the, mm -hmm. the hypertrophy movements yeah. is, are you tracking the volume and workload of that? Mm -hmm. Right. And then, cause that can be weird, like a split yeah. squat, right? If it's a, for some people it could just be body weight mm -hmm. and it's hard for them. Yeah. I guess you're going off RPE. So it's not going to make any difference because you're yeah. tracking the RPE, right? Yeah. Cause like, how do you figure the workload of a body weight movement? Yeah. I, I the stress index <laughs> helps me out a lot with that because it, it's going to, um, we're going to look at kind of number of hard sets, you know? Mm -hmm. So like if it's split squat, yeah, the weight's light, but it's still a, a hard set. So it's taxing from the perspective of, of that musculature. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the questions when I used to do clinics with Mel Sif, mm -hmm. you know, it would always get into, you know, the weeds of the workload and all this kind of stuff. Like, yeah, I was so intrigued with what I'm calculating all this stuff. Yeah. And I'd be like, well, Damn, like well, I mean, that's a central question, right? Like everybody <laughs> wants to know how many sets and reps do yeah. I do? And the answer is always like, it depends. And it, it really does. And it depends on all these things. And I mean, I'm trying to distill that down as much as I can. And, and I'm at this point, I'm pointing at it and saying, well, as long as the stress index is where it needs to be, you know, then how many sets do you do? Well, enough sets so that the stress index yeah. is where it needs to be. You know, yeah, his answer would always go back to the recovery. Cause yeah. I would point out examples. Like some people can only do six glute ham raises and that's body yeah. weight, but that's yeah. a six, you know, that, they can't right. do a seventh. That's right. like a, that's hard effort or yeah. chin up. Yeah. You know, some, yeah, you know, it's great. Some great big, example. big dude yeah. can do two. Right. And I'm like, man, that is like, you know, a max set of, deadlift you know what i'm saying it's a double it's a heavy double you know right, for yeah. a chin up and right it's not just body weight and doesn't count you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah you know or some people the push-ups and so forth and right. it, it, he would say well what do they recover from yeah and i'm like uh, that doesn't really help right you know where you, if you have an index like you're talking about yeah. that at least gives a variable yeah yeah you and know that, to be able to help i mean you can look at you can look at number of hard sets i think and and get pretty close yeah. that way my only quibble with that is that, you know, where do you draw, the, like, what counts as a hard set? Well, yeah. You know, and, you know, well, if you make the the parameters really broad, well, now those sets aren't all equal. You know, your yes. set at 7 RP is not the same as your set at 10 RP. Well, if you, then if you make the parameters really narrow, well, now you're excluding a bunch of stuff that probably mm -hmm. should count. Yeah. You know, so uh, stress index is kind of an answer yeah. to to a lot of that the funny thing at the time is all i wanted to do was to be able to fill out the excel sheet yeah you know because it had glute <laughs> ham raises right and i'm like okay well what percentage zone does this fall in right yeah and then how much weight do i calculate to come up with a total workload because i know the sets and the reps do i use my whole body weight yeah because last i checked my legs don't move <laughs> <laughs> do i use half my body yeah. weight you know it becomes yeah. this mind-numbing exercise and he's just like rolling his eyes like yeah. just do you recover from it like, <laughs> i need the number man right, you know yeah. it's freaking me out because you get so deep into the weeds on some of these things you know a couple of years ago um well our last move uh we were living in the netherlands we moved to wyoming and uh that was like may 2020 so right in the middle of the pandemic mm -hmm. and everything was shut down so there's like this three month time period there where i was just training in like in the house like where whatever i could figure out in the house mm -hmm. for like three months and so me being me, you know, I've, <laughs> I've got to figure this out. Right. So I knew this is coming in advance. So man, I prepared for it. So I bought a whole bunch of bands. Um, I got a 3d printer at the house, which is 
so for a nerd that's the coolest mm -hmm. effing thing in the world so i'd like design these push-up handles so i could hook up bands to them and everything and so i was doing like band push-ups and set up like these uh tie down straps so i was doing isometrics because how are you going to do heavy stuff well mm -hmm. you know, isometrics is something at least <laughs> mm -hmm. um Anyway, where the hell was I going with this story? You're printing stuff and you're moving around. Is there yeah, a, anyway, yeah. it's a three-month period of time. And, oh, that was it because you were talking about how much, yeah, how much of your body it. weight. Because yeah, yeah. I'm doing these push-ups and I had the same question. So I'm like, I got like the bathroom scale. I'm like, how much of my body weight? <laughs> yeah. So that's about 60% of my body weight. So, yeah. And then the bands, like, yeah, how do you yeah. figure that out? Do you figure it at the yeah. bottom? Do you figure it? Hell, that's I, a question for you. Cause I you just use it. winged it. I yeah. took the, the chart off your website yeah. and I was like, okay. Because, like you said, at some point you've got to simplify it. You've got to make some decisions and just yeah. do stuff. Yeah. Because you can't just wait for the perfect answer. Right? Now, when you put the bands and the chains in your training, mm -hmm. then what number do you base that top lift on? Is it the weight at the top? Is it an average? Or is it the weight at the bottom? Normally, uh, I'll just consider it its own exercise. Got it. So, say I'm going to use like a double mini band on a bench that's bench with doubled mini bands yeah and if there's 300 pounds on the bar then i log it as 300 pounds you know so i i, I kind of avoid the, the avoid the, the issue to that yeah but like it doesn't make a big impact from a stress index standpoint uh, it doesn't make a big impact from like an rpe standpoint like i'm going to consider it its own thing so uh, it's kind of spares me some of that mm -hmm. i mean i think if i was going to try to if I was going to use it as like an indicator lift or something like that, then I would want to measure it, you know. But, I mean, you run into problems with that, too. Setups are different. Bands get old. Yeah. You know? It changes. And it's you, first off, if you're, if you're going to put them in there, what percentage of the weight would you do you use for the band at the chain? Because some people go crazy, right? Sure. So some people are 10%, some 25 Where do you keep yours at? Yeah, I like to be... I tell my clients uh, we'll shoot for 15% plus or yeah. minus five. Yeah. Because there's always a little bit of, you know, yeah. if we're at 10 or we're at 20, then I'm not too broke yeah. up about it. You know, that gets us a good starting point and we can see, is there anything here to begin with? Mm -hmm. You know, you do, a, you do a block with 20% bands and your bench goes nuts. Then maybe we should do some more. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. maybe we should try reverse band, see if that works too. You know, mm -hmm. so the information that you get from one block can lead to more exploration blocks down the road. You know, but you figure that out by or the opposite, right? You know, yeah. it doesn't go well. That didn't work at all. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you're slow to learn. I've done so many blocks with weight releasers, just praying that it'll work. And I've just haven't been able to get them to work. You know. Um, <laughs> in, th in th you know, in theory, right? Yeah, I mean, in theory, it all that's makes the thing sense, that keeps right? me coming back to it. I yeah. mean, I've kind of uh, got to be a better student of my own training, I think, at some point. But I keep coming back to it, like, damn it, this thing ought to work. But you know, then I'll do a block. Six months later, I'll do another block. I'll get curious again, try again. <laughs> one of one of the ways, like the, the other issue is it's just a single that pops off. You know, right. where you there, so that. One thing that I've messed around with that had some success with was to use chains on them instead of straight weight. Oh, yeah. So if you look at the, the strength yeah. curve, right? So if you're going to load it 10% higher, that's 10% higher at the top. Mm -hmm. But at the bottom, it's higher than 10% higher, right? Because you're weaker at yeah. the bottom. So what if you could accommodate that? That's you know, interesting. So that, see, yeah. the chains can accommodate that. Yeah. But then you're dealing with this nuance of, well, you still need weight on right. there to be able to have the chains drape out and not yeah. come underneath the foot. Right. <laughs> right. But yeah. Then you still got the biggest problem is it's just one rep. Yeah. You know, what about the other two, you know, or there's whatever a, is in that. There's a guy who DM'd me recently. I can't remember if I sent this to you or not. Um, DM me recently is a, a Austrian company. Yes. And he's making these things that hook up to a barbell that uh, apply like a selective tension to the barbell and the, Apparently yes. you can program this thing however you want. So you could have like eccentric overload that would come off at the bottom, but then would repeat, mm -hmm. you know, 
I think it would be really interesting to play with. Now, that. you sent it to me. It's all in a different language. So, oh, I could just, you know, I, I'm just <laughs> yeah. putting together the pictures. Yeah, yeah. same but, here, actually. I mean, that was, I mean, that would be mine. Like, where do yeah. you start? You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, and that you can program it, too. And, like, yeah. you can program, like, you could make it way harder at the bottom and easier at the top if you want. I mean, I was talking to a buddy about that. And I'm like, man. Talk, that's my trip to the crazy house it is you know you don't you know you would need like 10 people that are like all nerds about it it's like you do this you do right, this yeah. you do this and then you got to have you know clients that are compliant yeah. you know you got to have a lot of things happening but i think it could happen that's a, right? i mean it's a cool idea i mean it's well i my schooling my background was in um management which is would essentially be a business degree if it wasn't uh, a military academy uh, but my capstone course was uh, building a business plan for a, like a theoretical, innovative mm -hmm. business. And that was what I dreamed up. Like I never like built the technology. That wasn't part of the thing. But it was imagining uh, this device that you would put under a weight, like a, under mm -hmm. a barbell that would add uh, tension to it like selectively. It wasn't as fancy as what they've developed but i thought man i'm glad somebody's doing this yeah, you know like yeah. i've been thinking about this for freaking 15 years yeah now something. you've been you've been a huge user of like the tendo and bar yeah. speed measuring devices yeah. um what what correlations have you found with that compared use in unison with the mm -hmm. rpe well there's definitely a correlation in most normal training scenarios that you'll that you'll find a heavier set, a harder set rather, uh, that comes closer to failure moves slower. No, of course. You know, it's the stuff that you would, you would observe that same type of stuff just yeah. with your eyes, right? It's just that having a, a device lets you measure it and then make comparisons. Uh, so you can come up with a more accurate estimated 1RM, which is convenient if you're going to start basing things off of that estimation. Uh, it's more objective and, um, it's comparable. So like today I was doing some incline bench and some front squats so I can look at my training log and see, okay, well I did. So, uh, on the incline bench last week I did, um, it was 10 pounds less, but the bar speed was faster, mm -hmm. you know? So this week was heavier, but slower. So how does that shake out? Like if you wanted to evaluate that performance, I mean, maybe you decide it doesn't matter that much, but if you decide it does matter, you can evaluate it and say, okay, if we distill that down into the estimated 1RM of those sets, which is the better performance? So you can do that calculation and you can do it more accurately if you have some velocity information. Well, it can allow, that we can also provide the information of when to pivot, right? Yeah. Because ultimately you could be increasing the weight each week, yeah. right? Yeah. But the velocity is dropping so hard right. that you're actually going backwards. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like you, you're supposed to do a, single at eight RPE, but like, look, it's not, we're definitely past the eight RPE mark, right? Yeah. Well, it's moving slower, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's just a tiny bit slower and it's worth the trade, you know, but maybe it's significantly slower and it's not. So you can measure that and do the math on it. And it, Have you used that as a tool as to when to end a set? So say it's a set of five, if the speed now, granted, you're not going to know this because you're seeing it after the fact. Well, you can you can set some of them, not all the devices, but you can set them to beep at you at a, a certain threshold. Uh, me and John, one of the other RTS coaches, we both kind of dabbled with this for a while, like doing uh, a block that was controlled by velocity loss. Mm -hmm. So what you're you're looking for a certain percentage of velocity loss and. Um, I think we used in the block that we did, we used like 20% velocity loss. So if a rep is, you know, slower than 20% below your fastest rep in that set, then it would beep, you know? Uh, so in theory, you know, you, you get a certain amount of fatigue, you know, and whether that takes you three reps or six reps, you know, you, you mm -hmm. go until the thing beeps. We had like semi success with it, you know. the The block was effective, nothing crazy, but we didn't like some of the logistics that it led to, like this kind of longer than we wanted pause at the top, waiting to see if the thing was going to beep at you. And sometimes you'd be like halfway down in your next rep, and it would beep, mm -hmm. and that's distracting enough to jack you up. So yeah, um, 
sort of some technical things like that that we didn't didn't really love and also that it kind of takes you out of the headspace of like i'm i'm here i'm focused on this thing and i'm gonna fucking do it you know? yeah uh, and i think that's important you know and it's the same thing with rpe like i hear people talk about you know i'm gonna you know if i i'm supposed to do five reps but after rep number three i know it's a it's an eight RPE. I'm not going to make it. Should I just rack the book? Like you shouldn't be thinking about that. Like you're supposed to do five friggin' do five, you know? And if you overshoot, then so be it within reason. Like if it's yeah. way off, then like, let's use some good sense, but, um, within reason, you know, do your set and then you can evaluate it and make some adjustments later. Well, one of the criticisms I've always had with RPE and RIR, you're not running into this because you're using your, your, clients are powerly that they're yeah. all the same population is determined upon what headspace when they start the set right because it's you know i yeah. can just casually go into a set and my eight's going to be completely different than if i hit an ammonia capsule and go into a different yeah completely different than a super heightened state yeah you know to where again it becomes a, a tool that the coach and the athlete has to right. agree right. on what this is because the, you don't want the athlete getting into the super aroused, uh, arousal state every single time they're going in to do the lifts, yeah. right? But they they could hack, for lack of a better word, their RPE yeah. on a day that they don't feel that good. You know, instead of just letting it just be the mm -hmm. eight, they start to realize as they're warming up, this shit feels heavier than it's supposed to be. Yeah. change their headspace now that eight really becomes a nine even though it's still – did you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. How do you try to accommodate that? I I mean, I think focusing on performance is probably where you want to start. You know, like if you're if you're here, then friggin' train. And if things are feeling off, then try to make it not off. Like, don't just automatically reach for the adjustment. But if you need it, then it's there. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of this comes back to the stuff that you know I heard guys talking about while I'm coming up is like, you got to learn how to listen to your body. You got to know when is the right time to push it when's the right time to back off and there's a feeling with it i mean it, i hesitate to use the term feeling even because it gives people this weird impression that you're just sitting up under your squat like how do i feel right now no it's not that at all mm -hmm. it's it's more like an evaluation of your performance you know and if you're doing your warm-ups and you're like man i'm performing like ass then get it together you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. bring a little bit more, show me something. And look, if you try, you dig deep and there just is nothing there, then, okay, we've got to adjust. We've got to show a bit of reasonableness, you know? Well, that's, you've spoken a lot about auto regulation. Yeah. So define that for me real quick. Like how would you define auto regulation? A system that adjusts supposed to be automatically uh, based on the performance that day the person doing that or the system doing that well it's supposed to be a system that does it i mean we're still at the point where we need a person to decide how much weight they're going to put on the bar yes but, you know if you do a set and you rate it a nine rpe and you go well that's supposed to be my top set for the day fuck it throw another 10 on there you know mm -hmm. like, well i mean there's decisions that are going to be made that are kind of outside of the system i would say at that point and Sometimes those work, sometimes they don't. There's a fair bit of judgment that goes into that too. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the reason I'm asking is the way that I'll, I'll define that mm -hmm. is the choices that I'm making personally as I'm in the gym, you know, and say working on. Sure. Right. So it could be even the movement for that day. But let's say it's a squat, you know, to take the bar first, bar feels like shit. You know, I'm going to take it again. Yeah. That was auto pivoted, auto regulated instead yeah. of just, you know, and, and. Well, that's the thing, like all these little decisions that you make, you know, like I've seen people like program training, like down to the warm up. I want you to take the bar for this many reps and then add 25. Like, how do you do that? You know, like, how do you program that for somebody? You know, I, I just can't imagine it. Like, look, if I need to take the bar again, I'm going to take the bar again. Mm -hmm. If I feel like, hey, if I take these little tiny jumps on my way up, I'm just not going to have time today. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to take some bigger jumps. So then, look, if you're healthy and you can do that, then do it. Right. I'm, I'm sure you've seen the, the same thing that I've had. And this yeah. is with, you know, 
top lifters. I mean, better lifters. First, the, the, the one more recent is, well, this is what my paper says, so I have to do what my paper <laughs> says, right? Yeah. So they start at 135, 220, whatever it is, feeling like shit. And it's, that's the one. You know, the other is, well, I'm, if I do all of those, I'm not going to be strong on my work sets. Yeah. So then they cut their warm-up sets in half to be able to do that. Man, that first one, though, I was uh, soapboxing about this before we even started, but uh, that one gets me sometimes, you know, this, this idea of the paper says, therefore I have to do it. And I'm, I fall into that trap, too, and I think, like, dude, if anybody should know better, it should be me. That's mm-hmm. the trap I fell into 2014 with the injury mm-hmm. and everything is, you know, by God, I'm going to do the thing on the paper. The paper works for you. You know, you don't work for the mm-hmm. paper. You know, you're the boss and you've got to be willing to make those adjustments. Like people get hung up on like, oh, I, you know, I, I let coach down or I failed the program or something like that. No, man, th- it doesn't work that way. The training gets tailored to the athlete and it doesn't work the other way around. Mm-hmm. I think where they have the disconnect is they they don't understand that all training is the best educated guess somebody's making. Yeah. You know, so whatever's on that paper isn't the best thing, right? Because nobody knows what the best thing is. Right. It's the most educated guess given the metrics that mm-hmm. they have, the coach would have, to be able to put it on that paper. Right. Now, if they don't see you, they're going to need a lot more variables to be able to make that educated guess. Yeah. If they don't have a lot of variables, i.e. just assessing one rep of the top set each week of each lift that they do, which is a lot of, you know, unfortunately, yeah. a lot of the online coaching that goes on is based upon that. That's one metric of a lift that should look like shit because it's the last set of the, the sure. heavy thing. Not like shit, you know what I mean? But yeah. it's not going to look gonna like the warm up. Yeah, right? There's yeah. definitely going to be more breakdowns. And I think if they understood that this is just the guideline just like any other guidelines you know needs to be pivoted if you need to take the bar three times before you can put a plate on then take it three times before you can put the plate on you know and just kind of go up from there but it's from what i see it's getting worse and worse and worse you know each year you know because it's that's what my program says this is what my coach says whatever it's going to be I'm like, well, call the fucker. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like, if, if yeah. call him right now. I don't care who it is or her, whatever. Yeah. Call your coach. Tell him your hip feels a little jacked up. Can you yeah. start with the bar or body weight I've, squats? I've never, <laughs> like, I, I don't think I've ever got on an athlete and, like, chastised them over something like that. Like, hey, I was warming up, but my pec felt real dodgy, so I decided I'm going to just pack it up for the day. I've never jumped anybody you know the, the, the interesting thing to me about all this is they they will never err on that side you know what yeah. i'm saying but they'll always err on the other side coach I, mean, I felt really good that day so i did an extra <laughs> you see what i'm saying yeah yeah though they're they're going to err on the side which will have the biggest negative repercussions i've got mixed feelings on that one though too because on one hand i think like you got I want guys to take it when it's there. We can't always predict it. So yeah, look, you're you're in there and it's you're feeling it. And part of like the Bonnerchuk mentality of uh, you know pushing it in a peak condition resonates with me. And I think, man, how many times per year do you get a chance to set a PR deadlift? Mm-hmm. You know, so if it's there, then I kind of want you to take it. And does it make a mess and cause problems? Yeah, and I'm going to have to clean that up. I don't want you to do that every week, you know. Yeah. And there are definitely people that take that too far. But yes. if we're really feeling it and it's not just a flight of fancy, then No, okay. I agree 100% yeah. with you yeah. because if you, if you don't, right, yeah. let's just take uh, low intermediate as an example. If you don't, then according to a lot of programs and a lot of programs they're going to fall on, they're going to they're gonna make a 10% gain every 12 weeks or whenever they peak. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe that ends up being 40 pounds on their 275 pound squat over a period of a year. Now you do what you're talking about doing or, you know, 
west side at conjugate with max effort if yeah. there the dynamic you would work up yeah all of a sudden that 275 at the end of the year is now 525 yeah because you took it when it was there yeah you know because those early strength gains aren't just always strength right there's huge technological oh, yeah. changes. One technique change can make, you know, this. I can put 50 pounds on somebody's lift. Dude, it, anybody that would doubt that, I'd invite them to do a serious block, a couple blocks of front squats. Because I think most power lifters haven't done it. And it's a really different movement. It, it's called a squat. You do it very differently than you do a back squat. It's mm -hmm. a different mechanic. And the first block that I did, I put 80 pounds on my estimated 1RM. And all of it was just learning the mechanic. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, real strength gain, whatever that is. Uh, the one RM went up 80 pounds. Mm -hmm. The reason was because my technique got better, mm -hmm. you know. So, and, yeah, take advantage of that. You can't just stay locked into the, the old thing because we're, the program says, you know. Yeah. What are some other examples that you've seen, like the warm-up thing with the program says, that people are falling short on? Yeah. I think... Well, rest intervals has been uh, more common lately. Like powerlifters already like have this reputation of taking 15 minutes yeah. between sets, and and uh, we've seen some traction from like, just being a little bit more intentional about rest intervals and uh, cutting the rest intervals down. In fact, I, I've been thinking about that lately. So a lot of my training programming roots are in what I could read about what was going on at West side and periodization Bible kind mm -hmm. of things, you know, and a lot of my early training was modeled after that. Right. And even as things have evolved and, you know, you try different things, uh, as you, your lifting career progresses, I would learn things that would run counter to what I did in those early stages. Mm -hmm. Right. But as time has gone on, I'll learn other things and that, kind of re-justify it you know and I, I joke about being a, a west side apologist mm -hmm. that, um, i find these justifications that are new to me at least mm -hmm. um you know one being um with a dynamic effort work you know i thought uh you know earlier in my career that like this this type of thing is supposed to you know make me stronger improve my force production it's uh dynamic effort method is one of the methods to display maximum force mm. output therefore you know it's supposed to work that way and then you get a little bit of information you know some i get my uh, tendo unit and mm -hmm. i start looking at it and i go wait a second i'm actually not getting peak force values from this uh, especially compared to what i'm getting with heavier loads i'm also maybe the transfer is you know mm -hmm. not quite as much or, or whatever right so it's easy to at that point go, wait a second, I'm going to write this off. I'm not going to mm -hmm. do that. And maybe that's okay at that stage of lifting, mm -hmm. you know, but then more time goes on. And, and like, as I look at things now, I think, well, maybe it's value isn't as much in like peak force development, but there's all these other adaptations mm -hmm. that can be like leading adaptations for other stuff down the road. You know, like I don't necessarily program it, that same way now, but we definitely do program like controlled rest, uh, controlled rest sets that are uh, sub maximal in terms of RPE. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, what's the difference? You you take a bench press and you do ten sets of three with sixty percent, or you do uh, five sets of five with seventy percent. Uh, both of them are at one minute rest intervals. I mean, there are differences. I'm not saying mm -hmm, it's exactly mm -hmm. the same thing, but that's pretty similar kinds of work compared to the broad yeah. range of things that could be, yes. you know? And I mean, I think, well, what, what could it be? Like what, what would explain that type of thing? Well, maybe it's, maybe it's metabolic. I mean, I'm There's also, a lot of things, you know? I'm also, uh, you mentioned that in, in, I mean, you, I know you're doing a tongue in cheek, but in a post that you made on IG the other day, you were talking about dynamic effort squats or conditioning work or whatever is acceptable to call this kind of work these days kind of thing. I forget mm -hmm. exactly how you, well, the it, way I'll, uh, the way I've always framed it is there's a new, there's a, no, there's a, 
with any training stimulus, there's several adaptations that are taking place. Yes. Without the adaptations, we don't even know about yeah, it, right? Exactly. So if, it, if it's not the force development, well, then maybe it's the first rep. Yeah. Because now you got eight first reps compared to other programs to where you're only going to have, you know, two or three. Right. So maybe it's the technique, the technical adaptation yeah. that's happening over the double, you know, because yeah. you have 16 total technical reps being done. And maybe maybe it's not that. Maybe it's the metabolic adaptation. Yeah. Or maybe it is the skill application because on that seventh and eighth rep, you're more tired. So you need to focus more yeah. on your tech. So there's a lot of adaptations yeah. where I don't think anybody can say this is why it had an impact or didn't have yeah. it. Unfortunately, we can't say this is why it didn't either. You know, that right. <laughs> we just well, know it don't. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's spot on. And that goes back to the hypertrophy stuff, too. That like why. Like, why do close grip benching like more close grip benching instead of some tricep pushdowns and pec flies and the other stuff? Well, is there technical value in doing that? I mean, it's not a huge technical challenge, but it's something, you mm -hmm. know, and it can be more than like any set that you do has more than one adaptation. Yes. The hypertrophy work isn't just hypertrophy work and there's this spectrum of it too. Right. Um, one of the way, take us back into Nerdland, I think, but uh, one of the ways I've been trying to understand this more lately, again, through this lens of stress index, you can, you can break this down uh, a couple different ways based on the mechanics of how stress index works. You can subdivide it into two components. I've just generally called it central stress and peripheral stress. And whether that's accurate or not, yeah. How you how you how you distinguishing those two? So central stress is, if you think of stress, the stress index calculating like the fatigue per repetition, and you're adding them all together. You know, so like say you're doing a set of ten uh, to failure. Yes. Well, the first rep is not as fatiguing as the yeah. last rep, and so like set of ten to failure, uh, stress index kind of does that math and crams it all together. Well, you could look at central stress which is similar to like uh, uh, the average stress per rep. So like heavier sets have a higher average stress per rep, okay. you know? Um, so it, it's more biased toward heavy work. Then peripheral stress tends to be more biased toward lighter work. It kind of works out so that the central stuff is measuring something like intensity, something like mechanical tension, you know, you look at that a couple different ways. The peripheral stuff is, kind of like the metabolic demand of what's going on you know so if you take 70 percent and you do two sets of five or you do one set of ten you know it's the same total volume but one has a, a higher metabolic impact mm -hmm. and it'll it'll rate higher on the peripheral side of things i've been kind of looking at that as a way to start to understand like what different training effects you might be experiencing like in a, in a more mathematical way mm -hmm. right and it makes this gradient right so like it at high intensities it's really biased toward the central adaptations and at low intensities well it kind of depends on what we're doing with some other variables in rpe but it makes this gradient and you can look at that and say oh i see so if you're trying to strike more of a balanced adaptation then maybe you'll be you know it, it's nothing that we didn't know already you know, which to me is confirming, right? Yes, like if it yes. was completely out of left field, that would be a red flag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it puts a number on it. And, you know, one of the questions that we always ask, like, why five reps instead of four mm -hmm. or six, right? Well, it starts to give you an answer to that. Like, well, for this particular lifter, we're trying, they need a little bit more central stress. So we're going to bias it a little, a little bit more toward that, mm -hmm. you know, so we'll do four. You know, this other person needs a little bit more peripheral stress. And, you know, kind of what are you used to? Uh, again, what's producing the best results for you? Uh, we have some lifters that just don't respond well to high central stress programs. And then other people just live on it. Mm -hmm. And that's really damn important to those people. No, know? I mean, what, what you're doing is, is, is awesome, right? Because you're what you're in the process of doing and have been doing is taking that answer that we put out years ago <laughs> yeah. is just do the shit for five years and you'll figure it out. Yeah. We'll figure what out. You know, you see what I'm saying? It's like, we, we couldn't even tell you what that, what was, you know, and now you're starting to get a handle on I what so. some of those things are, yeah. 
you know, which can expedite that process, you know, for people coming up through to be able to know because, and it's probably more needed now because you have so many people that are so dependent upon here's what the paper says. Yeah. So they're not being, um, what's the word I'm looking for, coherent in what they're doing in, while they're in the gym. Yeah. You know, they're not. There's, there's less behind it, you know, less reasoning behind the decision, like all those little decisions that yeah. anybody has to make in the gym. There's, you know, you need something to inform those. Yes. You know? I, I think it'll always be experience, though, you know, and I mean, to that end, like having a good group of people around you to help make those decisions. Uh, I don't know how you replace that. You know? Well, I, I don't think you do. Right. Yeah. And it's the <laughs> where you know, going dating, you know, going way back, you know, there was, there were still people helping, you yeah. know what I'm saying? They were helping either in a crew in a gym or whatever yeah. it was, or there'd be conversations you have with people on the phone. You know, you're just talking yeah. to them like, Hey, look, my bench ain't going anywhere. You know, just, you've had tons of these things. Yeah, right. Yeah. And maybe you pick something up mm -hmm. then you try that, you know, so it's now all that information, it's exchanging at a much higher rate, but it's also diluted, Yeah, you know, so it's not as, tight or yeah. is what it was so it's hard to you can you can impact more people but like in a lower resolution kind of way like if you get on the phone with somebody yes. like like i got on the phone with you when i was a sophomore in mm -hmm. high school you know like that's a you get your answers you it's a complete conversation mm -hmm. you know whereas if you're just kind of picking up nuggets from this post or that post it yeah, I think I think you're right. I think coherent is the word. It's less less coherent, yeah. you know. I think a, another thing that people should look at is the longer there's there's a lot of positioning, you know, that I that's I don't know what else to call it. You know, that happens in the industry, mm -hmm. you know, with people that are selling X program or whatever it's going to be. You know, so <clears throat> obviously their bias is going to be really really strong. Um it's it's very easy to tell, you know, where the positioning lacks experience mm -hmm. and education in my opinion you know a lot of the times is the, the the absoluteness behind the answer that's coming yeah like this works because of x and yeah. only x not yeah. the other variables that could be in there but here's what it is yeah. and the longer somebody stays around you know the more experience the longer they're in the industry the more they realize it could be this or this sure or this you know or this and um but there's those voices are um lower than all the other ones combined, yeah. you know, that are out there to where. Well, like you saw the the obsession a couple of years back, maybe resurgent obsession with belt squats. Yeah. You know, and I think that came from that type of absolutist sort of statement. Mm -hmm. I mean, justified or not or whatever. I mean, totally different conversation. But mm -hmm. um, you definitely see the effects and the trends and how people how people train. Yeah, I mean, you've been along, you've been around long enough. It, we're sure. seeing things <laughs> cycle, yeah, a cycle. Yeah. You know, it always. I wonder when we're going to get obsessed with Bulgarian daily. Max it's coming, right? Because that comes about <laughs> that comes about the same time that yeah. bodybuilding goes from high volume into yeah. hit training. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's you see, like the high volume has been going yeah. for a long time. Yeah, it's it's about ready, right? Yeah. And where we've been in this, I don't know though, because powerlifting has been kind of weird for the last outside of the sport just uh -huh. the training yeah. and weird in a good way though it's been pretty balanced and pretty block centric i guess yeah. you know for lack of a better way to describe it for the last five it's not really swinging hard it's just kind of sitting it seems like i mean for what it's worth i'm not terribly dissatisfied with like the the big rocks that i see in powerlifting training i think yeah. i think it's mostly fine it's better than it used to be for mm -hmm, sure mm -hmm. and uh, uh but yeah I, I think the pendulum swings that i see tend to center around exercises like this exercise is going to be the thing that yeah. gives me whatever but that also means we're just a short time away yeah. from the frequency to come it's for the for the yeah. bulgarian stuff yeah it's it's coming you know it's, it's we'll have to well i mean to be fair like some of the questions yeah. that, that popped up like about hypertrophy work and stuff like that, like that is part of the paradigm now. So the other direction for that is a refocus on hyper specificity 
and Bulgarian training fits mm-hmm. in that paradigm too. You know, it's it's crazy, right? Because it's we've seen it over and over, <laughs> right? But at least what you guys are doing is you're 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 building the program around that individual based yeah. upon like that that build up approach is well, huge. I wanted to if we know that people respond to training differently and everybody's got their biases, right? I've got mine. Yes. I want to be able to work with an athlete and come up with a program that's counter to my biases. I want to, if that's the best program for them, I want to be able to find that program, even if that's something that I look at and go, nah, you know, I still want to be able to find it. And I've found several, Mm -hmm. several like people where you look at it and you go, there's no way that you can just do like five sets of lower body training in total per week Mm -hmm. and make progress on that reliably. And I'll be damned. There he is. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know? And if we push it past that, then sure enough, yep. He's dinged up and and injured again. So we got to back it back off. And I mean, if you think about that, like just five working sets for lower body in total, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just not, it's, it's almost nothing, you know? Um, so we've definitely, run into some surprises yeah yeah no, it, it, it is top level administrative level core level federation level whatever it is mm-hmm. powerlifting's always kind of been a mess right <laughs> so i mean it, it's for yeah. for decades so it's any of the complaints and stuff that we see now are not things that we haven't already seen several sure. times before right where at the at the core level you know the lifters in the warm-up room pretty much the same as it's always kind of been yeah um what advice would you have for those coming in now that are seeing the drama? The, I don't know mm. how to, the drama, mm. right? Because it's, as, say, you're, if, if I was a new lifter coming in, a couple yeah. years in the sport, you're passionate about the sport, you love the sport, then all of a sudden you're like, the fuck? You know, and <laughs> right. it, it, it's in administrative levels, yeah. federation levels, and yeah. they, they don't understand this, this isn't the first go around, it's the fuck since the very beginning. Yeah. Um, what advice would you have for them to better wrap their head around that? I mean, that's where experience can help a lot. So, like, if you do have a coach, then a coach should help you navigate that. Um, and then other beyond that, I think keep in mind why you're doing this to begin with. Uh, and also understand that that's something that will change and evolve with time, too. Uh, but you probably like lifting weights. You probably like being strong. You like, probably like competing on some level. So just do it, you know. like There's little, I mean, as I think about it, I think there's very little uh, getting married to a federation at this point, um, especially for like local level types. Maybe further down the line, like as you progress and you get to like some feds are uh, more into the non-compete kind of stuff, but try not to pay attention to that stuff too much. You figure that out later, it'll become more clear with time. Um, one thing I find myself saying is a quote that I borrowed from uh, Pete Blaber, uh, but it's when in doubt, develop the situation. So you don't know what fed to compete in or something like that. Well, just keep learning. Don't panic. You know, hang in there. And, you know, you make a decision when one is clear. Until then, try to keep your options open. You know, keep in mind what, what got you into this to begin with, which is lifting weights and being strong. Mm-hmm. That's, that's where I would go with it. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I mean how do you wrap well, now, now that you're back into it, right? Yeah. It's, I'm sure your headspace is different being back yeah. into it, but a lot of it's still the same. You're yeah. not going to bullshit me on that one. There's no, no way. It's still in there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like, how are you navigating that? Like, Fair. should I go here? Should yeah. I go here? Like, where? how do you I did do that? Think, I did give it some thought. And, like, from where I sit, like, I'm thinking about, like, what what are my purposes behind competing? And I can't deny that part of it I hope will be helpful to my business you know that's that's a thing uh and to me winning a world championship is is, is meaningful you know plus most of my clients uh, my personal clients uh, are competing at that level so for me to go to an IPF world championship it, it matters to me personally it matters to me from a business standpoint and it's helpful to my clients so for me, that informed a lot of my decision mm-hmm. to go back in that direction. But, you know, we've got plenty of people who are, you know, 
maybe principally opposed to go in that direction. They want to continue competing in USA Powerlifting, or they're fed up with the whole thing, and they want to go a different direction entirely. We work with, we're not really a fed dependent, you know. Hey, wherever you want to compete, we're happy to support in any way we can. Yeah. And we're fortunate, too, like with a coaching staff, we'll be able to have a presence at, like you said, man, the powerlifting drama is frustrating and silly for mm -hmm. freaking everybody, especially like you've been around it for a while. Like, you know, the people mm -hmm. you're like, they aren't bad guys. You know, they aren't, they, there's very few, like actually, uh, malevolent players in this, you know, mm -hmm. people are trying to do what they can, but just can't seem to get along. So, um, I've been successful in just treating people like people like, yeah. Hey, look, I understand that you guys don't like those guys anymore. Uh, I have to go over here because this is what's best for me. No hard feelings, right? Handshake, no hard mm -hmm. feelings. Okay, cool. You know, I think I try to keep things on the up and up and if no, well you came yeah. back at a weird ass time, right? So <laughs> yeah. if, you're, if your time for sure. is for, you know, IPF Worlds, yeah. well, what's your path there now? Well, uh, Powerlifting America, uh, my next, okay. I signed up for a competition in November, uh, and I'm going to try to do Powerlifting America uh, Nationals. Mm -hmm. Now, I say uh, get back to IPF Worlds. I mean, that's a long road because there's some strong dudes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> no, yeah. so I, I definitely don't want to write anybody No, off, but you but, need to take the right yeah. path because you exactly. can't go in a certain federation because then you're never even on that road. Well, right? I think I think at a local level, I don't. I wonder how much, how far, uh, how far I should go without knowing for sure. But always up to now, like at a local level, people haven't cared too much mm -hmm. about about stuff like that. And I would say keep your options open, you know, to the extent that you're able. So, um, you know, if you're competing at a local level and there's a Fed that wants to restrict your competing opportunities, I would try not to go that way now at the same time you're probably not gonna you're probably not willing to jump on an airplane and fly across the country no, to compete no. in the local you know but so you're gonna you're gonna compete in what's nearby mm -hmm. but i don't think that's that's usually not long-term limiting you know and then if you get to the spot where you're like hey i, I would like to do so-and-so's nationals that might close some doors. Well, you're probably a couple years in at that point and better able to make that decision. Yeah, I, I'll agree with you on that. Yeah. I mean, once you get to that certain point, you're going to know yeah. which path you're, you're going to navigate. But the, the, the thing that I'll remind the people of is to, yeah. to understand they made the choice on their own path that they want to navigate. Mm -hmm. So when they start bitching about other people <laughs> who made a different choice for their path, sure. they still made their own choice too. Yeah. You know, so it's that's where it gets weird because that's where you're almost playing into what the Federation seems to be trying to do to each other. You know, is to downplay one for the other. Yeah. And then they get lifters that think they're Federation dependent, but they're not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's helpful to talk to experienced lifters and coaches, I would say, you know, and and I mean, even most fed officials that i've talked to if you talk to the people and mm -hmm. you're not like you know trying to pull a gotcha in some no, public formula yeah, yeah, yeah. forum then people are willing to to talk mm -hmm. person to person you know and, and give you the straight but uh the only yeah. thing i've never been able to figure out because it happens on all sides it happens mm -hmm. on multiply saying it, uh, all it everything you know whichever discipline you're in the same things happen mm -hmm. And the people that most of the people you talk to, they're all want what's best for the lifters. So the, the, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, no, wait a minute. If th then who are, who are the assholes that are doing all this? Yeah. You know, like where where does this start and stem from? We're a little philosophically opposed sometimes. I think like I don't know. People like the freedom to make their own choices until they're the ones in the power to make choices for other people. And then people <laughs> decide that, no, they really do know best and yes. you need to listen to me. Yeah. I think you just summed it up perfectly. Well, there's, there's <clears throat> more, more than just powerlifting falls into that category, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. 
but it's it's powerlifting is a microcosm of you <laughs> yeah. know it's, it's just crazy yeah. how it is but the the one thing that keeps resonating with me is when i had ed Cohn on you know mm-hmm. he just his whole premise since ever since i've known him you've mm-hmm. known him as well is his only goal has ever been to do better than he's his best yeah to his standard yeah that's it not to compete against anybody else whatever it's going to be yeah. I think the the more people that can adopt that philosophy, the better it will be. Well, I mean, I'm I'm really biased, right? Because yeah. that is my philosophy on things. That I think that kept me. Well, I know that that kept me lifting when I couldn't compete in powerlifting. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's. I, I mean, I've talked to talked to my friends and other coaches about this too, because. Like a friend of mine, Mark Rob, I've known him. He's been part of RTS since, mm-hmm. like, since we were like one year in, like since the beginning. Um, he's been training for like forty years, you know. And we talk about like, what is it about this that keeps you coming to it? You know, like, there seems to be something meaningful in it to us. You mm-hmm. know, and I, I, I'm sure you're the same way. Mm-hmm. I want to, I want to keep loving it. You know, mm-hmm. so what can I do to, to kind of cultivate that, you know, and how do I continue to, to find the meaning in it? And I think a lot of it is that mentality of trying to be better than I was before focusing on my own performance, not getting hung up in the external and keeping the focus internal. Mm-hmm. Cause even the, even if you're not, I mean, every top lifter I've talked to, you ask them if organized powerlifting wasn't a thing, would you still lift weights? Hell yeah. I'd still mm-hmm. lift weights, mm-hmm. you know, so you care about something in this that's not just the organized lifting it's not just the competing so what is it you know and i mean I, i'm positive that that's different for everybody and i wish i had like some like really profound conclusion to that thought but yeah you know, for me it's been trying to figure it out like it's a big puzzle and i want to figure out what the what the answer is how how much better can i build this mousetrap until it's mm-hmm, fucking mm-hmm. awesome yeah you know? well i think a lot of that answer comes when you're and you're and you're doing it now mm-hmm. and you've been doing it over the past decade or whatever helping other people find their own answer yeah. is going to help you find yours those transition points too like it, was that i mean it had to be big for you too like when you you decide Hey, I'm going to step back from powerlifting. That's a big transition point. Oh, it's huge. And there's some, there's an unknown there. And, you know, you're a couple months in, like, oh, wait, I actually do still, still love, I still love this. I still want to do it. You know, um, there's a self discovery process. You know, it was bad. I mean, for me, I, it, I hated it for a few years, yeah. you know, which is one of those times where I like sure. kind of disappeared from, you know, this and yeah. pushed the other people up in front of it because I couldn't do it, mm-hmm. you know? And then I realized that it wasn't the competing that I loved the most. Yeah. You know, it was the straining, the training, you know, the yeah. training, that kind of stuff. And it was, and there's, there was a change of soul, soul atmosphere too. I'm no longer in the gym that I was in, you know, the, so yeah. there's the social dynamics that are, that's huge. You know, that's, that's, hard to grapple with so there's a lot of things you know kind of playing with that but it's kind of like going through the, the stages of death or grief yeah. you know so like, yeah. yeah so just it goes through then there it is and it's from there then you you get reconnected and you're like man this is why i got in this shit in the first place when i was 12 years old this exactly. is what it is and then the perception shifts and it changes and you realize that helping other people you know a lot of times and i'm sure you've you felt this it's think back to how you felt when you won the worlds yeah you know it's a great feeling it's fleeting but it's a great feeling you know now think back how you felt when somebody you coached did it right you know and then it's replicated yeah and replicated yeah. and replicated you, you see what i'm saying so at, at that point you're like wow you know this purpose you know wh- whatever you want to call it you yeah. know is a little some of that answer yeah you know i don't know because we still end up under a heavy freaking bar you know what i'm saying it's and i i don't that i can't explain that yeah but i can explain you know the passion for the training and loving the training and then wanting to let other people know that have that same passion that it's it's cool yeah right because we all were told right like what are you doing this shit for you ever (laughs) gonna stop this you know you you, and that's yeah i'm sure i'm sure that that uh 
comes more frequently as time goes on too like yeah hey don't you think it's time like eh, no i don't <laughs> mm-hmm. no but it's it's where we can help other people that True. are going through that because we've all been through it probably yeah. <clears throat> probably worse you know yeah. because it's more popular today yeah so people can look it up oh that's what that is i mean we're trying to explain to people what powerlifting is that think we're bodybuilders and like do i look like a bodybuilder yeah <laughs> <laughs> well uh, like you were talking about like the change in in social circle i mean that's i mean as big as ever i think you know and that is one thing that made it a lot easier for me to kind of stay connected to the sport uh when i took a break from competing that hey i'm still training and still coaching was a big one that i'm still going to competitions seeing my friends and um, involved in the same types of things just in a little bit different way now even if you're not coaching you can still do that right like yeah. powerlifting is driven by volunteers for better or worse yeah you know and i mean there's ways to get involved and be a referee and and ways to continue caring about it you know? and i think that it broadens it too at least for me it broadened it you know after i was done competing because the social circle is small yeah. you know i mean huge introvert even though i got a sure. podcast i'm a giant yeah. introvert right yeah. so so that social circle was always very small you know and towards the last 10 years of my career very small very biased mm-hmm. you know very fuck everybody else you yeah. know very tight right yeah. so then you're you're living in a one room a, you know apartment in a high-rise building mm-hmm. you know yeah, and yeah. once you can get out of your your room and you start to realize there's other rooms yeah. and there's other people in these rooms that have the same passion that I do. Sure. Maybe not competing on the same situation, same circumstances, maybe it's drug free, maybe it's IPF, maybe it's whatever it is, yeah. but we all got the same thing and we don't know how to explain what it is. Yeah. And it was fucking awesome to be able to find That's those people. Cool. You yeah. see, because there's like, oh, it's not just my little group. It's like, yeah. there's, there's all kinds of little groups. Yeah. All, and I think that a lot of people get stuck in their own little group. Yeah. You know, and it's like, oh, screw it, screw it, whatever it's going to be. And they don't understand that the same, you know, whatever, yeah. you know, is is all over the place, you know. And it's having the business allowed me to, to see that, you know, see that in you and different different people out yeah. there that are like, wow, man, we think differently. We compete differently. But holy shit, like, what is this? Yeah. It's, you know, whatever that kernel is, it's still there. Yeah. Like, and, yeah. Then, and then what are you doing that can help? You know, there's all this free trade whatever you want to call it you know of ideas and concepts that i mean after we're done talking today i'm gonna be like you know (laughs) so it's like what the hell you know like what can i do and you put this in there and it's just it's it's freaking awesome i mean that that's a huge part of that purpose yeah yeah you know that just is the an added benefit yeah you know i think of being around it with and that that whatever i just said (laughs) is what the newer lifters need to go back and listen to again yeah because they get caught up in that tribalistic little bubble of this is bullshit because of this federation or this rule whatever it's going to be yeah, yeah and they lose sight you know of the bigger picture yeah and man you reminded me i made a significant error in coaching uh some some years back had a lifter who was coaching coaching for a long time and uh we were dealing with a bunch of injuries and this is maybe one of the limitations of the online platform, but mm-hmm. probably more so a limitation in my coaching at the time. Um, dealing with some injuries, and he's telling me that, you know, he's just not motivated to train. He just kind of doesn't feel like doing it. He's sick of dealing with it. And, you know, and I'm talking to him, and I'm trying to get him to reconnect with his reason for doing this to begin with. What is it that he cares about? that brought him here to begin with and didn't provide enough guidance on that question. And he thinks, I don't know what my purpose is here. Therefore it doesn't exist. Therefore, what am I doing this for? Mm -hmm. And so he sent me a message like, Hey, I'm out, you know, and I I messed that one up. Mm -hmm. You're doing it. You you're finding meaning in it. The purpose is there. It's not something that you're assigning. It's already there. It's there for us to to find, to discover. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something that we're doing to it. It's already there. And that's been kind of the the thing that keeps me, you know, 
it, it's like you're you're holding this thing you're like what is this thing in this process of figuring that out over the course of the years but then it changes over the years too like mm-hmm. in the beginning it's i don't know what you're trying to impress girls or, uh, whatever yeah yeah do do well at a sport or something but then you care about strength and then later still you know um back uh my first assignment in the air force was to minot air force base in north dakota and i would train at the ymca there and uh a friend of mine named Gary Clock had been competing in powerlifting since the 60s. And he was still training. This was like 2008, uh, 2007, 2008 time frame. Still training, still fucking getting after it. You know, he's not hitting PRs anymore, but still working hard at it. And I would talk to him uh, and he would tell me like, you know what? If I don't squat every week, my knees feel bad. So, I mean, there's a damn good reason mm-hmm. to keep squatting. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And, like, he would still do all this stuff. I mean, he's finding some meaning in it, even though that message isn't for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. But it damn sure is for me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what to tell tell people to do with that. But Well, I think the the (laughs) other thing with with some of the people is, you know, as the sport has grew, and it's I, I I kind of think it hit a crest and it's yeah. and it's going to come down for I mean that's a whole different discussion but it's yeah. not in a bad way I just right. think that's just you know how things kind of work with all that and you know as it you know comes down I think a lot of people that came during that crest just are on this false assumption that it's it's all happy go lucky you know and that there's not just blocks or phases that just suck You know, that you just don't want to do it, but you still do it. You don't know why you still do. So there's for some there's years that are like that, you know, that just suck. But you put in the time knowing if you put in the time then on the back end of this, it's going to hit. You know, you just I don't think they I don't think they know that, you know, or understand it. Yeah. I, I see that happening in a training context a lot of times. Like you'll see people get into the gym doing some whatever they do as beginners right and a lot of people are doing stuff that is inspired more from uh, bodybuilding or whatever there's Mm -hmm. a a significant variety to the Mm -hmm. work you know and uh over time they start to come across this idea of you know specificity high specificity of training high volume of training high frequency of training and around that time they're hitting this intermediate stride you know, or early intermediate stride. And that works great, you know, and it works for a good long while too, you know, and it, I mean, that'll take you through maybe your eight, maybe your 10, maybe your 12, depending on the person, how much volume can you tolerate, mm-hmm. you know, but it does stop working, but it takes, it happens fairly early. It's got a good logic to it and it takes you so far I think a lot of people end up kind of getting married to the approach. Yeah. And, you know, you hit that, again, the kind of number I throw around is like 15 years, you know, 15 years training age. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you're still banging your head on that wall, but it ain't working anymore. You know, you've got to do, reintroduce variety, you know, find a different, find a different way. You can't just, you know, run the ball straight up the middle every play mm-hmm. <laughs> you know you mm-hmm. gotta gotta mix it up a little mm-hmm. bit you know any other takeaways that you have for those intermediate lifters that are dealing with the stagnation you know i guess yeah. is what we're talking about i mean paying attention to to what's working and being willing to try stuff you know even if you don't understand the logic of it completely you know, I mean, so you sink a block into uh, two board press, you know, it worked or it didn't work, you know, and you can start to form a picture. And I mean, just being willing to uh, lean into lean into your own training data a little bit. I mean, that's auto regulation. That type of message has been the, the common thread to run through my whole career. So I I guess it's uh, uh, appropriate to kind of hit on that again, you know, but yeah, paying attention and being willing to, to experiment with those types of things 
and just understanding that those observations that you make are real and that's the very best kind of data that you can come across mm -hmm. you know, it's it's data that applies to you specifically you know it's not uh, eight recreationally trained college females that you know i don't know that try some intervention and it, yeah it worked for them but if that's not you you know you're a you're a heavyweight uh male powerlifter with 40 years training age like dude that's a whole different world you know so i mean it's good idea fuel if nothing else mm -hmm. uh, but it always has to be viewed through the lens of your own training data uh, tell me about the services that you guys offer so you have an app right is that the training log thing that you were talking about yeah, so the training log is free uh, for yes. people to use so if you go to reactive training systems.com and uh, you log in click on apps and you're there uh, anybody can log their training. You can run block reviews. Uh, there's a workout planner tool. It, again, the whole idea is help you make good training decisions, help you put the right weight on the bar, lift it the right number of times, and will help you uh, learn from your training log. Uh, and if you want to go beyond that, uh, probably the best place is the training lab. Uh, it's a fairly new uh, thing that we've been doing. There's a community aspect to it where we've got actual coaches and experts running office hours. These are like live meetings. You can jump on a call uh, with a RTS coach, with uh, an expert in biomechanics, with an expert in uh, injury rehab, uh, like a licensed PT, uh, or somebody who has expertise around nutrition, whatever. Uh, pick their brain as much as you want, like get actual good information that's specific to your situation get all your questions answered. Uh, there's a program library with programs that we built uh, that we use for real clients. Um, lots and lots of different strategies. So like what we talked about a lot today, you know, like I, the bench press example, mm -hmm. like that's maybe a, a typical thing that I, like a typical go-to for me, a place I might start, but there's so many different programs, some high intensity, some more high volume, some use uh, lots of short rest interval stuff, some don't. There's a bunch of different strategies that you can use. So we can look at some of those coherent strategies and you, then you throw that into a program builder. You can modify it, put your exercises in there uh, and then run it through our training log. It'll load that stuff into the training log for you, spit out some uh, uh, target weights based on past performance. Uh, so we're trying to make this really uh, useful especially for self-coached lifters, but even people who are coaching a small roster or something like that, you can put your clients in there, monitor their training easily, uh, see, okay, well, stress index is way up this week, or you know, performance on the accessory workouts has been stagnant for a week or two. You can see all that and mm -hmm. start to uh, make advanced decisions based on actual information. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm uh, clearly excited about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So, I, I mean, uh, is, there, is there a level up after that to where they're working with one of your coaches? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we uh, offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, there's discounts for uh, junior lifters as well. Um, but that's like one-on-one -on -one coaching. We're like walking you through this whole process. We're going to figure out time to peak. We're going to figure out greatest hits blocks. We'll uh, set up the structure and... You know, it's a, it's definitely a collaborative process. Uh, some stuff that we believe about coaching. I think mean, coaching involves like three major components: leadership, relationship, creativity. So leadership it comes from the coach uh, to help guide, provide guidance, and help with decision making. Like the it depends answer is fine, but mm -hmm. it depends on real things, and we can get down to an actual answer, and that's leadership, and it's built on relationship between the coach and the athlete, having a, an actual understanding of each other, an actual relationship uh, to, to help formulate some of those decisions because a lot of them are subjective. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, professional relationship, I think, is, is a really important component, probably the bedrock component. And then, like, my favorite, obviously, from listening to me talk yeah. is the creative problem-solving bit. Everybody runs into slightly different issues with their training. I've been working with uh, one of my clients for years now. Uh, he's an ER doctor. So 
constantly dealing with weird schedules, uh, dealing with different things popping up. So we're always making adjustments and like that's just got to be part of our planning process. And that's different for him than it is for, you know, somebody with a with a more typical type of mm. scenario like a, another one of my clients is a, a, a college student training for junior worlds so you know for for her she's on a regular schedule mm -hmm. you know and it's not that chaotic you know yeah. but then she'll go through periods where she's away from from school so the gym changes so, so creative problem solving is integral to doing coaching well mm -hmm. i think so that's kind of the three pillars as far as uh, how we view coaching. Yeah. All right, and we'll put the website in the description. It's probably already in the description. How can people find you? Uh, reactive Training Systems, so reactivetrainingsystems.com, Reactive Training Systems on IG and YouTube. Um, and then I'm uh, Mike Tushier, most active on Instagram. Okay, I wanna thank you for coming out. As I've said in the last episodes, I still haven't figured out how to end the show. So yeah. I just say we're done and then we're done. Cool. Actually, it might have to be the way we end the show. It's the same way. Maybe I have it already, didn't know it. <laughs>